Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Hi, this is Anthony. Happy New Year! Well, actually, for those who watched the stream uh, last Wednesday, uh, I already cheered for a Happy New Year. But for all those who didn't watch that stream, and you're not supposed to watch the stream because I was just, you know, um, just messing around. Um, so, Happy New Year, guys! Um, I hope that you are spending a good time. I am, even though I had um, a coding fever, sometimes it happens to me. And uh, during this coding fever, I was uh, studying AI applied to game development. And uh, at a certain point, I decided to, again, once again, for the probably 10th or 12th time, to build my own game engine. <laughs> so this is what I've come up with so far. Um, not a really good game, it's just a small Neko, a small kitty, Japanese kitty, moving around. But uh, it's not just a game, it's a game engine, so you have the ability to build games like this, uh, simulations like this, uh, through some uh, configuration that it should be as easy as possible. But uh, it's still a long, long way before I complete something uh, that is enjoyable. So. Please, please start um, studying JavaScript and please learn it as fast as you can because you have to help me on this game engine. I cannot do this all by myself. Angela says, good morning and happy new year to all. Tiago Stu says, good morning. Hi, good morning for those of you who are in the morning. I hope that you are, you are listening, yeah, right? Because I had my audio on mute, but uh, yeah, it should be fine. So, today we're going to, to go with JavaScript. We already started um, last year, oh. um, but we were ahead of time. And uh, since this is the new year, maybe we can also do a little bit of rehearsal of what we mentioned at the end of last lesson. So, today is the 9th of January 2021, 9 a.m. UTC, and we're going to start our journey on the uh, about the JavaScript language, which will be a long journey, especially the part about the fundamentals. This will not last one lesson, it will last multiple lessons because it's the, well, the most important part. We will probably skip or uh, go a little faster on other slides. Or if you're interested, we can even go further uh, along and we can uh, not stop at 2021 20, lessons. We can go even further in April, May. Uh, how about we, we wish? I uh, just need your feedback and I will do whatever you want. Um, what else? On Slack, I saw some activity. There's Sao who shared with us her curriculum, which is awesome because it's also responsive. And I love the, uh, the fact that she also um, welcome my suggestion. So these buttons are very well usable. You can click on anywhere on this button and you will go on that page. Um, and also she, I, I saw that she um, experimented a little bit with uh, other things that I never explained, such as this uh, horizontal timeline. And there's another one here, I think. This is a vertical timeline. Nicely done. So she wanted to add a timeline in her website. She didn't know how to do it. Probably she looked on the internet. Or she came up with uh, this timeline herself. Hey, there's Sao. I was talking about you. <laughs> and, uh, and the result is perfect. It's beautiful. So kudos Sao for this beautiful website. With which I discovered that Sao is a chemical engineer too, just like Tiago. So, two chemical engineers in the hood. Nice. Okay, let's dive in into JavaScript, okay? Remember that I'm... Oh, wait, one last thing. Uh, we are in, on Slack, but at a certain point there was someone who was asking if there was a Discord a server. Discord is another chatting platform. It's something like this one here. And it's really, really similar to Slack. It has some more features and some fewer features. For example, there's not the ability to reply into threads in Discord, which is something that I didn't, don't really like. But uh, yeah, I saw some correction. 
Awesome, awesome. So, um, so Discord doesn't have threads, but it has the ability to create easily multiple channels and multiple channel categories. So I created a Discord uh, server. I created some uh, categories and channels. So you can see the mains category contains the usual generals, jobs, jocks, and lulls. But there's a whole category called schools in which I can send you announcements about the schools. Uh, about the school and there are some discussions about the topics that we are covering so the cli git the web design which means html and css part and javascript and then once you uh, once we end this course maybe we will start learning new stuff and discuss about new stuff so this is the category in which we can discuss about some uh, technologies based on the things that i am uh, that I'm teaching you right now. So we can discuss about React, Vue, and Angular, which are famous front-end frameworks in JavaScript, something about gaming, AI, quantum, blockchain, or whatever other channels you prefer. So please join me on Discord too. The link to Discord is on Slack. And uh, I'm probably thinking about moving from Slack to Discord for this uh, school. I'm really, really not sure. Uh, for now, the Discord channel is quite silent because just three people, pro yeah, three or four people, um, <laughs> finally saw the message and decided to uh, to, to accept the invitation. But uh, I'm I'm always available. I'm all available on Discord. I'm available on Slack. So you can find me anywhere. But remember, um, we're trying to build a community, so I would like to see you guys interact one with each other, and uh, and we have to choose one platform over over the others. Um, Discord has another cool feature, which is the speak ch speaking channel, so we can use our own voice if it's really needed. I, I don't know. I would love to see, to hear your voice, of course, but. Uh, I don't know if this is really that important right now. Okay, so let's go back to JavaScript. I already... Good morning all, says Pot Arrow 2003 Hi, Spot Arrow. Nice to see you. So, uh, we already talked about uh, what is JavaScript, what, what it allows you to do. And uh, remember that all the reference material that I am uh, referencing in my slides, pardon the pun, is um, just this website called JavaScript. Dot info, which is a completely free and also somehow interactive tutorial that you can find online. You can also buy the PDF version, the EPUB version, uh, so you can give some uh, recognition to the author. Uh, but still, it's all for free because maybe this person here doesn't care uh, that much about uh, compensation for his efforts, just like I am doing right now. So, uh, we're going to uh, tackle JavaScript using this as material. And you will see that at the end of each page, which covers uh, one topic, you will have some a summary and some activities. In this page, you don't see any activities because it's just a description of JavaScript. But as soon as you start diving into the, um, the, the, the tutorial, you will see that there are some activities to do. The activities are really important and you should do them as many as you can. Uh, no, they're called tasks. I'm sorry. They're not called activities. They're called tasks in here. So you have to do all the tasks in order to practice between streams. If you don't have the time, if you're stuck, if you have any problems, I'm going to start, starting from uh, next Wednesday, to do the tasks online on Twitch. So Wednesday afternoons, Wednesday evenings at uh, 6 o'clock my time, which means uh, 5 o'clock, I think, um, UTC, well, 5.30, let's say, uh, I will uh, connect and I will do just the tasks, just the practice. So if you're lazy or if you tried and failed, we can do the practice session together. Um, while on Saturdays, I just go forward with the program. Unless, of course, there are some uh, really ob big obstacles that we have to face so we can do some exercises together in this instance. Uh, we can do that. Okay, so um, let's go back to the introduction on JavaScript. You already know that JavaScript is a 
scripting language. It's an interpreted language, not a compiled one, which means that this language is read by the computer and executed line by line uh, as soon as it is read by the computer. Unlike compiled languages, which require um, a step of translation into, from that language into some machine language, and then the machine will be able to run the machine code language. Um, but this is a, a scripting language, it's an interpreted language, which allows us to do something like this. We open the console, we do 2 plus 3, and this is a valid JavaScript sentence, and it's immediately read, interpreted, and executed by the browser, which is something that other languages such as Java or C Sharp are not able to do. You have to first compile the language, so you have to translate it into something else, and then you can, uh, you can allow the machine to read it, parse it, and execute it. Okay, let's uh, close this uh, game engine, because it's not really that important. Um, okay. JavaScript has this... Uh, actually ugly name and uh, it's an ugly name because it's uh, it's it was a marketing strategy a really unsuccessful marketing strategy uh, it was the time of java java was a really famous uh, mainstream language and they then they thought that uh, uh, they would call this language javascript in order to follow the, uh, the, 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 the thread of, uh, of uh, fame of Java. So it was marketed as the Java's younger brother, but it has nothing to do with Java. So remember that Java and JavaScript are completely different. Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hamster. So they just start with the same uh, bunch of, word of letters, but they are completely, completely different. Uh, it was also marketed as Java's younger brother, which is not true, at least it's not true anymore. JavaScript is a uh, first-class uh, first citizen in, um, in, IT, uh, in the IT environment. In fact, I think it even went uh, beyond Java uh, as, well, as fame and as uh, usage on the, on the market. Um, JavaScript... Has, is interpreted by multiple engines, but the most important one is called V8, and it's the engine that we are using right now. It's the engine that is developed by Google, and, well, the open source community behind Google, and it's the engine that is uh, running right now these slides, which, as you can see, are just a web application running on the browser. It is running this editor, because this desktop editor called Visual Studio Code is made with web technologies, JavaScript, interpreted in the V8 engine. And even this chat is running on V8, etc., etc. So everything is running on this engine. But there are more than one engine. If you're using Firefox, Firefox is using another engine called SpiderMonkey, if I remember correctly. Okay, this is a spider monkey, yeah. But spider monkey is the code name for the first JavaScript engine written by Brendan H. Eich at Netscape Communication. Brendan Eich is the father of JavaScript. It's is the person that in seven days, uh, one week, developed the JavaScript language, and he created this uh, engine uh, called Spider Monkey, and this started the the journey on JavaScript. The this. Uh, this beautiful journey that turned the, this uh, scripting language that just wanted to make pages alive, uh, it became a fully featured language that can be run on browsers, on, ser on the server, uh, as a desktop application for mobile devices, on embedded devices such as the Arduino, those microcontrollers, IoT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can use it for VR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not saying that you should use JavaScript anywhere. Uh, probably doing JavaScript for video games is not really, especially AAA games, uh, is not really a good idea. Maybe other languages are more suitable. In fact, Unity uses C Sharp, the Unity game engine. Unreal Engine uses C++ mostly, I think. Uh, JavaScript is probably too slow if you want to have a fully featured game engine that allows you to run games at 60 FPS straight. But still, JavaScript can be used for games, and there are some, uh, uh, some open source 
game engines out there. This is for 2D graphics, Phaser. I love this one. Really well done. But I'm trying to create my own game engine, because why not? Okay, so the JavaScript language is uh, following a specification, which is very well documented. It's the ECMA standard. In fact, some of them, some, some developers call JavaScript ECMAScript, which means that it follows the specification of ECMA. So ECMAScript is how the language is intended to be. JavaScript is an implementation of this language uh, created by some, some other people or by ECMA itself. Uh, there is some documentation in the Mozilla Developer Network, MDN, or in the Microsoft Developer Network. And there are some uh, features of JavaScript that you can use on the browser, some features that you cannot use on the browser. Um, some features are available in certain browsers and some features are not available in other browsers. And you can have a look at what your browser is able to do with this website here, what web can do today. Or you can go to caniuse.com to see which browsers support which features. It's not really that important nowadays because Almost every browser out there is actually um, a rendition, a different flavor of the Chromium browser, which is and has always been the open source base for Google Chrome. So if you are using the Brave web browser or if you're using the newest Edge web browser or if you're using Opera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are all using the same engine, uh, the same rendering engine, the same um, JavaScript engine. So most probably all these browsers actually support exactly the same features. So you don't need to care too much about what you can do and what you can not do. Um, as code editors, you can use whatever you want. Uh, we are using Visual Studio Code, which was made by Microsoft and it's uh, completely open source, really well done. And we can use the developer tools, which you already know because you just open F12 or Control Shift I or Command Shift I, whatever you have on your um, on your operating system and you will have the developer tools on your browser which allows you to do multiple things we started looking at some of them for example the elements panel allows you to look at the html part of this web application and also the css being applied console is an interactive REPL of javascript by REPL, i mean a read evaluate process loop something like that uh, we already saw it last time and it was something read eval print I'm sorry read eval print loop so it's just uh, like the terminal like the Linux terminal it's an environment in which you write something and the, 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 the um, this system reads what you are writing evaluates it and prints the output and then starts all over in a loop so this is the console, and if you installed already Node.js, like we already did in uh, lesson number one, when you open a terminal, you should be able to do Node, and you are, you are inside of a JavaScript uh, environment in which you can write pretty much the same things that you are able to write on the browser. But here, there's no browser, so you can see it's all textual. You can quit with Control D. We can quit in multiple ways, but I usually use Control D to quit this environment. And now I'm back in the shell, okay? So, multiple developer tools, and we're going to have a look at some of them along the way. And uh, about practice time, about these slides, there's not much to do. We already done uh, pretty much everything. So we'll go straight to the fundamentals now. So first things first, we want to say hello world because hello world is the usual sentence you type whenever you learn a new programming language. Historically, it's like this. So in order to create our first hello world, we already done it, but we are going to redo it again pretty quickly. Everything good with the... Um, with the chat, yes. Uh, I'm going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call it, uh, I don't know, 10 dash. Uh, oh, I have this JavaScript fundamental, so I'm going to do this. Oh, okay, I'm going to do it again. So 10 JS fundamentals again. 
and this will be huge. So I have to create a new folder on my uh, on my repo, on my mono repo, and I'm going to create a a new folder called Hello World, a subfolder, and inside of this subfolder, I'm going to create a new file called index.html. You should be quite familiar with this name. Index.html. Uh, I'm going to create all the, um, all the all the code base to start writing an HTML file. And um, last time we understood that we can use the exclamation mark and then press enter to have all this boilerplate code ready for us. Here in the title, I can say whatever I want. I'm going to write hello world. And this is not, however, our hello world application. It's still, it's just the skeleton of it. Uh, I have, again, some auto formatting features on, so I'm going to, to disable them. Okay, so now it should be disabled, yep. And finally, we can start. How do I write my first piece of JavaScript? Well, the worst way I can do it is by um, creating a script tag in the page. And in the script tag, I can start writing JavaScript code. For example, I can type 2 plus 3. But the problem is that if I type 2 plus 3, this expression is being evaluated and uh, it's not printed anywhere. So this is not a really good example. I will show you what happens. I open this with the live server, which you should be familiar with by now. And you can see that our page is completely empty. There's nothing in here. I just have the script saying two plus three, but I don't see the results. I don't see the five, right? Because this is an expression that is being calculated, computed, but then I'm not doing anything with this expression. So one of the things that I can do to show some results is instead using uh, one of the first functions that you uh, start learning in JavaScript, which is the alert function. If I put all this two plus three inside of an alert, then as soon as the, as the page refreshes, I will see this pop-up. This pop-up is an alert. And this pop-up says five which is actually the result of two plus three. So uh, alert is one of the ways I can see my output. It's not the best way because a pop-up is blocking. It doesn't allow me to do anything else until I press OK. But still, it's, it's something already. Um, so now instead of two plus three, we can start finally saying our famous sentence, hello world. And now the page opens a pop-up and says, hello world, exclamation mark. If you're having any problems, this is your chance to tell me. Because maybe you lost some of the previous lessons. Maybe I went too fast. Maybe I'm doing something that you don't recognize. Um, and this could be a good moment for you to say, hey, how did you achieve this? Hey, the alert doesn't work for me. Hey, what happens, et cetera, et cetera. Please note that I'm writing this alert, hello world. This sentence, hello world, is in single quotes. I can also use double quotes, which um, yields exactly the same results. So I put double quotes and it just works. But if I don't put quotes, well, this is an error. And you will probably understand why it is an error in a while. But still, this is an error and the console will tell me that there is an error. Missing closing parentheses on after argument list. What? This is not telling me that uh, I forgot to put quotes. This is complaining about a missing closing parentheses, which is not true. And this is one of the examples in which the machine is trying to help you, but is not able to understand what you were, what you meant. It's just able to understand what you wrote. What you wrote is not usually what you meant. You have to try as much as you can to write what you mean and mean what you write. So in this case, the problem was not a missing parenthesis. It was a missing 
quoting of this string of text. And now it just works. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm going to show you any other ways to, to, sh to, to, to show things on the, on the web page for now. But another thing that we can do is instead move this script elsewhere. Just like with HTML, you can type some style directly in here with the style tag, but you don't want to. It's much better if you, do, if you created a, a separate CSS file and then reference it here with a link. Uh, the same goes with this JavaScript. You don't want to put JavaScript right into the HTML page. You want to put it on a separate file. For example, I'm gonna call it hello.js. In here, I'm going to write only the JavaScript code. So no tags. You don't need to put any HTML tags because a tag belongs to HTML, doesn't belong to JavaScript. So here we just type the JavaScript part and I'm going to type it again, hello world exclamation mark. And once I have all this JavaScript code, I can replace this script that executes this code with a script that actually references the other script, the, the, the other file. So in this case, there's no difference between, uh, in CSS you have style or link. In this case, you have script or script. <laughs> There's no link to a JavaScript. It's still script for some reason. So you can use the script tag with an attribute src. src, which is also used by images. Remember, you can use a source uh, URL to reference an image. And this is exactly the same case. You can use a relative path. This is a relative path. This is like saying from this folder go to hello.js. Or you can just uh, leave it like this. And the script usually needs to be opened and closed. In fact, you see that there's something strange going on here. The syntax uh, the, the colors are strange because the body is usually red, but this body is not red. Why is that? Well, for some, I think, historical reasons, the script must be opened and closed properly. You cannot just auto-close the script tag. There's no need for that. In fact, you whatever you write in here has no effect whatsoever on the page. Probably one of the reasons why we want this is that if your browser doesn't have JavaScript enabled, you probably can type something here that will show. But I'm not really sure because I think that there's also a tag called no script. Yep, no, not, not this one. <laughs> no script tag. Yeah, there is a tag called no script that shows you a message when JavaScript is not enabled, which is not really that important because modern browsers usually have JavaScript enabled. You cannot do anything without JavaScript. If you're trying to go to, I don't know, Facebook without JavaScript, you won't see anything at all. There's uh, very few uh, websites nowadays that can work without any JavaScript at all. So don't try it. You can just uh, create a script with SRC hello.js and hello.js contains all the JavaScript code that we want to execute on the page. And this is the result. Hello world in a pop-up. If this is not your result, please tell me. I'm here for you. We can stop, we can slow down any time and uh, to give you the, the, the opportunity to, um, to catch up and continue together. You will see that the more we go forward, the more it will be impossible to follow if you are missing some steps behind. Everything that we are doing right now is, uh, I, think it's pre I think we can say preparatory for the, the uh, upcoming things. So it's really, really important, especially now that we are learning the fundamentals. Okay, so this was the script tag, and if you read the JavaScript info page about the script tag, it tells you a lot of stuff. It also tells you that sometimes we put some comments, but we, I usually don't do it. Um, you can reference scripts that are local, or you can reference scripts that are uh, placed in some other server on a CDN, just like we did with CSS, so nothing new here. And here, this answers the question that could arise if you have 
one attribute that points to a separate file, but also some JavaScript inside. Well, apparently, if you do the experiment, you will see that the content here is completely ignored because if there is an SRC attribute, that SRC attribute will have priority over any content that you type inside of here. If you want to have both a script that is defined elsewhere and some JavaScript code that you want to, uh, to to be written inside of the page, well, you can do you can add two script tags, one that references the file and then one that contains your code. Angelo says, so we cannot open the JavaScript file directly with the browser. We need to link it to the HTML file. That's correct. Thanks for the question, Angelo. Yes, exactly. Uh, the browser is not just able, is not able to run JavaScript itself. The browser runs HTML pages and HTML pages contain some style and contain some JavaScript because JavaScript was still born as a language that does something on your web page. So JavaScript by itself has no meaning at all on the browser. It has some meaning outside of the browser. So in a Node.js environment, it has a lot of meaning. In fact, here on the terminal, as I already showed, if I go inside of a Node.js environment, I can start typing JavaScript code with no HTML document involved. And in fact, since here we don't have a browser involved, I cannot even do some of the things that I usually do on the browser. So for example, what happens if I do, oops, <laughs> sorry, uh, what happens if I do alert hello world on Node.js? Well, we have an error because alert is some j piece of JavaScript code that opens an alert, a pop-up on the browser. But here we don't have any browser, so we don't have the alert. And that's why on Node.js, this says alert is not defined. Which could seem like a problem because how can I show the result of what I'm computing without an alert or without the, a, a web page? Well, Node.js shows the output of what you're saying directly on the terminal. So you don't need to, uh, to, to, to alert anything or to show anything on a web page. On the browser, however, yeah, uh, either you open the console, so you can just uh, go 2 plus 3 and you will see the number 5 printed here, or you need to show something on a web page. And the alert is the most common way to do this. But we will see later on that there are other ways. Uh, let me see what happens if I do body.innerHTML is equal to high. I'm just experimenting a little bit. No, nope, it's not working because I cannot just say body. Um, document.query selector body inner HTML. And now I see something in here. But this, as you can see, is pretty difficult to type right now. So we will come back later on on this kind of thing. But still, here JavaScript, as you can see, is able to perform calculations and then show them on a specific environment, which is the document. It's the web page. If you want to use JavaScript outside of the browser with output that is visible some, uh, in, in a different way, then Node.js is, the right, uh, is the right solution for you. Okay, so this was about the hello world. There are two tasks. Show an alert, show an alert with external script. These are exactly the two tasks that we already did right now. Um, you have to do them by yourselves without me typing and without any reference code in front of you because you have to develop the skill in which you remember what you're supposed to do and, and, and you have to remember what's the correct way to type things. Because if you start typing something like, I don't know, alert with two L's, this is not going to work. Which? Okay, this is not going to work. Reference error. Alert is not defined. Or if you type alert with a capital A, same thing. Alert with a capital A is not defined. Some of you who are not used to case sensitivity or just accuracy, uh, robot accuracy in general, will say, 
How come alert is not defined? I know that alert is defined. Well, because there's a difference, a huge difference between alert lowercase and alert with a capital initial letter. So you have to experiment with these things and fail and tr try again and bang your head until not only you are able to make it work, but at a certain point it becomes natural. So if, uh, if you struggle with one of these exercises, um, try to solve those exercises nonetheless, you can use my help and the help of the community if you just ask us. And there are some people right now that are uh, asking me for some, uh, for some advice or uh, some help. I even did a one-on-one -one -on -one Google Meet conversation with one of you uh, in order to fix some problems and go, and go further. Um, but as soon as you manage to, uh, to, to finally solve the problem, if you struggled a little bit, Wait a, wait a little bit and then you do the exercise again because by the time that you do the exercise again you probably forgot how you solved it or you partially forgot how to solve it and it should become natural it should it, you, you should not be just able to solve the problem but you should be able to easily solve the problem before going forward with our exercises if it's too difficult for you then stop there continue uh, practicing and then we can go a step further so here we got solutions for these tasks so please don't open the solution before trying yourself next wednesday i'm going to do these tasks without rehearsing anything at all i'm just going to uh, open my editor read the text of the task try, try to uh, execute exactly what it says for example i'm javascript written exactly like it is and see what the result is. Okay, then let's talk about code structure. This is already something that we mentioned um, last time. The code structure is like this. You can have one or multiple statements. The statement is this. This is a statement. This is something that you are asking the computer to do. Hey, please computer, please browser, Alert me with a hello world. This is a statement. Statements can uh, end with a semicolon. And in fact, lots of programming languages have statements separated with semicolons. Um, you have seen this thing also on CSS. Every property, every rule in CSS is separated with uh, semicolons. Well, this is really important in uh, languages such as Java or C Sharp, C++, etc., etc., because, well, um, semicolons are part of the language. But JavaScript, few people know this, has optional semicolons. You can just completely omit them. There's just one special case in which not putting a semicolon will uh, lead to errors, but it's such an um, uncommon special case that, in general, you can just remove semicolons. Um, also, you can type multiple statements in the same line. But in that case, that's one of the reasons why you have to put a semicolon to separate statements one from the other. And still, who told you to put statements in just one line? Put every statement in, each, in, in its own line. Because it's, it's much better, it's much more readable and uh, it's, it's less error prone. So, hello world, and then Wait a second, hello world, I'm refreshing the browser, hello world, and then how are you, and the code is over. So as you can see, statements can be written in the same line, and in this case they should be separated with semicolons, or you can place them in two lines, and in that case semicolons are not that important, you can just remove them. Um, there are some other languages that don't rely on semicolons, for example Python or Ruby. So, other scripting languages really important. And also the bash usually doesn't need any semicolon unless you put statements on the same line. So I would say that in general, not always, but in general I would say that scripting languages, interpreted languages such as Python, Ruby, JavaScript, the bash, usually have optional semicolons. Instead, statically typed languages, uh, strongly typed languages such as Java, C Sharp, C++, C, usually need semicolons because they are more rigid. 
Um, you can also put some uh, new lines like this. In fact, the, the new line doesn't mean that the statement is over and that's it. Uh, you can place two plus, let's go to a new line, three plus five. And here, every new line doesn't implicitly say that there's a, a semicolon in here. It just means that it's a new line. So this still works. I will see the result, 10, and the, the, the interpreter, the JavaScript engine, is able to understand that after an, each new line here, we don't need to put a semicolon. The only semicolon that will be automatically added by the, by the interpreter is this one here. Still, please don't write code like this. <laughs> if you have this kind of sum, just put it on, a, on the same line. It's much better, much more readable. And here there's a box that shows you the one of the very, very few cases in which not putting a semicolon will lead to an error. But it, uh, it involves something that we haven't explained yet and we're not going to do this uh, anytime soon like this. So we don't need to, put, to, to, to worry too much. Still, uh, since many languages need a semicolon, and uh, by default, I think that the, 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 the default style in JavaScript is adding semicolons, I will try as much as I can to add semicolons for you. But I'm doing this for you only, because in, in my uh, experience, I usually strip away every semicolon. But since we are uh, in a teaching environment, and I would like to teach you the rigor, uh, the correctness, I will still try as much as I can to add semicolons. And if I miss some semicolon, please tell me in the chat, okay? This will be also a test for your attention and your attention to details. Okay, let's go forward. Uh, there is a... Um, yeah, this thing about use strict, I'm not going to tell this anymore because it's not really that important. But if you start your code with this use strict string, use strict, and it could be, as always, single quote, single quote, or double quote. It's the same thing in JavaScript, exactly the same. Well, in this case, you are instructing the interpreter that you want to write good JavaScript, a stricter JavaScript. So the interpreter, the, 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 the engine, will start complaining a little more when you do mistakes. Usually JavaScript is pretty resilient, just like, uh, just like the browser itself. When, when you write um, a bad HTML or bad CSS, the browser still tries to interpret a little bit what you were trying to, to say. JavaScript started like this and uh, it looked like a buggy language, mostly because it was too resilient. So uh, it, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell if it was an error in your code or in the language itself. If you add this use strict string, then JavaScript will start complaining a little more and you will be more convinced that the problems that you're facing on your application are because of you, not because of the language. But I'm, I'm not going to use this use strict. It's not really that important nowadays. And uh, if you go further beyond this uh, basics of JavaScript and you start using some, uh, uh, some tools and frameworks, the use strict string will probably be added um, automatically by the tools that you are using. So you don't need to, to say this. Variables. So, variables are pretty important and I'm going to remove everything here and I'm going to, um, to tell you something about variables. So, you see that we can perform some very basic calculations such as 2 plus 3. In fact, a computer is just a fancy word to, see, to say that this is a calculator. Whatever you do on the computer is just some calculations and storing of data or storing of uh, the, uh, the result of these calculations and presenting the result of these calculations. It's all math, actually, but it doesn't look like math. It looks like uh, uh, some visual things. So what, what happens if I say something like two times, the times is performed with the asterisk, two times five plus six. Do you understand what I mean by this? 
Yeah, of course, you probably understand that this is a mathematical operation. I'm just doing 2 times 5 plus 6, which means 16, I think. But what do I mean? What, what is 2? What is 5? What is 6? Well, I was thinking, and you don't know because I didn't tell you, that 5 is how many apples are inside of a bag of apples. And six is how many bananas are inside of a bag of bananas. So if I'm saying two times five plus six, I'm actually saying that I have two bags of apples and one bag of bananas, and I want to know how many fruits do I have total on my bag. But it, it doesn't show that much on this calculation. This is what is usually called a magic number. As you can see, I started a comment here. Um, we didn't rehearse comments, but I'm pretty sure that you remember them. There are multiple ways to do comments. The, the usual way is this one here, hello world. And this can go into multiple lines too. There is another kind of comment that starts with two asterisks which is uh, even better because, you, you see, when I go on a new line, it automatically creates these uh, other asterisks here, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is usually for documenting your code. And then this, this other uh, kind of comment, which is very famous, and this is just a line comment. You can just place it on a one line. And if you go on a new line, this is not a comment anymore. As you can see, the color changed. So this is good for one-line comments. You can place these comments next to your code, or you can place this comment, well, even on top of your code. It's exactly the same. Uh, but I usually put these next and this other comment um, on top of the, on the code. So this is usually a problem on our code called a magic number. We have numbers, but we don't understand the meaning behind those numbers. That's where usually variables can help us uh, a lot in understanding a little more what our code is about. In fact, I can declare a variable like let apples, and this is creating some, some kind of label that I can place on some uh, on some value like the number five how can i assign a value to this variable i can say apples is equal to five now the variable called apples has a value associated with it and the value is the number five so now instead of just saying five here i can use apples and this code looks a little better because I'm reading not two times five plus six, I'm reading two apples plus six. Well, it's not really that true because apples are not two. <laughs> it looks like five. So this is not really a, a good name for a variable in this case. Maybe we can say bag of apples, okay? I'm gonna rename all these uh, occurrences of the variable into bag of apples. So now this variable has a different name and I say two bag of apples plus six. Okay, so this looks a little more like what I was thinking about. I have two bags of apples plus six. What is this six? I said that this was a, ba a bag of bananas. So we can also create another variable with let bag of bananas. And we can assign the value six to the bag of bananas. But here I'm going to show you that you can declare a variable, assign a value or uh, yeah, initialize a variable. So here we are declaring, declare a variable. Here we are assigning a value, assign a value to the variable. But we can do the two things at the same time. Here I'm declaring and assigning a value to a variable in the same line. And this is usually what you do. If you know immediately what the value is, you can just put it here. And now I can just replace this six with bag of bananas. 
And now this uh, expression, even though it looks longer and probably more verbose, but it tells me a lot more than before. It tells me that I have two bags of apples and one bag of bananas. So what is this? Uh, this is the total of my fruits. I don't know if I can say fruits in plural. Maybe I, can, I have to say fruit. I don't know if there's a, an, an, another way. I'm sorry for my English. But if I want to show this on the, on the browser, I can alert all of this, including or excluding the comment. Well, if I put the, uh, the parenthesis here, you will see that there's some problem because magic number is a line comment and the parenthesis is part of this comment. I don't want it to be part of the comment, so I have to put the parenthesis here. This is one of the mistakes that you are going to do when you write by your code by yourself. You have to do these kind of mistakes. So if I write all this code here, this is the result. 16. 16 is my total number of fruits. Okay? And as you can see, variables allowed me to create some code that does exactly the same thing as typing 2 times 5 plus 6, but, oops, but this code doesn't tell me, doesn't tell me what I am calculating. This code instead is telling me what I'm calculating. I can even go further than that. I can use the 2 and the hidden 1 here to say, for example, I can say, let uh, bags of apple is equal to two. So how many bags of apples do I have? Two. How many apples in a bag do I have? Five. Um, how many bags of bananas do I have? Well, in this case, it's one. It's not explicit, but it's actually one bag of bananas. And uh, how many bananas do I have in a bag? A bag usually fits six bananas. So with these variables here, I can now alert a full computation. Or maybe I can even create a new variable. Let total fruit is equal to the number of apples times the apples inside of a bag plus the number of bags of bananas times the bananas contained inside of a bag. And now I can just alert the total of my fruits. Of, I don't know what to say. It's going to tell me did I, did, I, did, did I do something wrong? Probably not. Let me try again. 16, 11. What did I do wrong? Bags of bananas. Oh, okay. I said bags of bananas instead of bananas in fruit. Uh, bananas in a bag. Okay, so 16, 16. You see that these two, these two pieces of code, this one here and this one here, tells exa tell exactly the same story, but they tell it in a different way. This one is a lot more explicit. This is uh, more implicit. And the, the first one that we had, which was 2 times 5 plus 6, this is really obscure. This is the magic number. So I'm going to put the comment magic number in here. Magic numbers. These are magic numbers. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I can alert them and it will yield the same results but I have no idea what they mean in my code. Uh, on the browser, of course, I still see just a 16, but here on my code, I'm not giving the reader, the developer, which is myself, or some other developers in my team, or someone that will want to help me write this code, I'm not giving any clue on what these numbers mean, or what these numbers mean. In here, we're starting to declare variables, and this allows me to make the code readable. This is probably the most readable uh, code because every single number has a meaning. Oh my God, too many alerts now. 
every single number has a meaning and uh, and it's really easy to to understand it and to change uh, some variables in fact now we can also say that uh, right now I don't have uh, one bag of bananas I have three how do I change it I just put three in here and the rest of the code will just work with three bags of bananas instead of one while in this case for example with magic numbers I have to remember that this number six refers to how many bananas I have in a bag and I also need to add a three times in order to say that the bags of bananas are three not one anymore but this is quite difficult to understand especially if you don't look at this code for a few days or weeks or months and you don't remember what the six was about instead variables in this case as you can see automatically document your code somehow it makes it read better than not having those variables. Angelo says, if I want to add text in the alert, do I leave the mathematical operation out of the asterisk? Um, you know, I want, to, I want to answer, and my answer will be this. First of all, I'm going to comment out everything else, because I don't want these alerts to spam me uh, all over. So I'm going to select all the code that I want to, to mute and once selected I can use a shortcut in order to comment out the code which means that I'm not removing the code, I'm just muting it. The browser will not, the, 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 the engine will not interpret and, uh, and execute my code. How do I comment things? I have a shortcut in my Italian keyboard which is control shift sl slash control shift 7 in your case it should be control slash or, con or command slash if you have the slash key we Italians do not have a slash key we have the slash key on top of the number 7 so if I do control shift 7 or your shortcut you will see that your, com your code the selection is all commented out and if I redo it it will be uncommented so I can toggle between commented and uncommented and if I save it now I just see the final result so if you want to mix some text with the number there are multiple ways to do it but one way to do it is to in the alert create a string uh, fruit uh, total fruit something like that uh, a colon just to make it fancy and then I add a space and outside of the string I put a plus and this plus in this particular case doesn't mean that I'm summing two numbers and this is the cool thing about dynamically typed languages such as JavaScript you can add apples to oranges you can add numbers with strings adding doesn't mean adding in this case it means concatenating which just means that I have a string and I'm going to append another piece of string next to it so what JavaScript does when I'm putting this plus here it's actually taking this number it's, it, it's converting it into text into a string and then it's going to concatenate those strings together append the second string right after the first one so if I do this, I can see total fruit colon space 28, which looks good. Not the best thing, but good. Um, you see that I place this extra space in the string, because if I don't put the extra space, I see total fruit, but it's not really that readable. I, I don't like the fact that there's no space in here. Watch up. Uh, I see OBS disconnected. This is really bad. Are you still with me? Okay, reconnection successful. Did you see any... Did you experience any problems in the connection? Hello? Yes, yes, you experienced problems with the connection. And what about now? Is everything good? I should probably ask you to... It's okay now. Okay, okay. So there was just a small defiance. Okay. Um, so 
What I said, uh, I would like to add a space between total fruits and the actual number total fruit. So where do I put the space? This is another one of these errors that you should you could incur if you try to experiment by yourself. Maybe you put some space in here and even if you put a lot of space, the result is that you have no space at all in here. And why is that? I'm putting a lot of space. Maybe I have to put the space in here. No, this doesn't work because all the space that I'm adding in here, it's space that I'm adding inside of the code. And all the space inside of the code has no effect whatsoever on what's printed to the user. Just like adding spaces in the HTML doesn't have any effect on what the user sees. So, as I already showed you, you can even go on new lines in here. And this doesn't affect the, the code at all. In fact, you can even put something like, uh, if you format this, like, like here, uh, it, it, is, it, it could even be a little more readable for some, because you have bags of apples times apple in a bag, bags of bananas times bananas in a bag, and uh, you have this uh, nice line. You can even create something like a, a grocery store um, list, you know, uh, the price of th something times the quantity of that something. In fact, we can also uh, change the, the code in order to make it something like, um, uh, yeah, like a, 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 a sales, sales line. These are sale items uh, times their price, and then we can have the total cost of these items. And adding all these spaces and all these new lines doesn't affect at all the code. What affects the final result is placing spaces inside of the string. So if I'm placing multiple spaces in, inside of the string, I can see the spacings being, um, being written and, and visible to the user. So what you have to do is put a space e here, right inside of the string, because this is a part of the string that is shown to the user. Okay, so variables are really, really important because of multiple reasons. First of all, they make your code more readable. And second, we can easily change one value and be sure that that value is uh, propagated throughout the rest of the code. In fact, what if I have uh, bags of apples times apples in a bag plus bags of bananas times bananas in a bag plus I'm going to make... Um, I'm going to add some extra apples. Uh, some, I want three more apples, three more, um, three more bags of apples. Uh, this is a magic number. I should probably create another variable for that. But still, as you can see, the point is that I'm reusing the same variable. If I were not using variables, uh, this would be five, this would be five, and this number, I, ha I have two occurrences of the same number and I have to change both of, of occurrences of the same number whenever I need that the apples in a bag are four. If the apples in a bag are four, I have to change this four here and I have to change this four here. But if I instead, I'm using this variable here, apples in a bag, I just need to change this five into a four and now all occurrences of the same variable are automatically changed. This is what uh, variables can do. Uh, I saw a jumping message from Bobby, I think, and I think it was on Discord. No? Where was this message by... Oh my god, I, I don't understand what happened. I thought I saw a message floating around on my app, but I don't see it here. So I, I think it was Bobby. If it was you, Bobby, please tell me what you've done and I'll try to help you. Send a message? I don't know. Okay, um, still no, no message from Bobby here, right? Nope, okay. 
Anyway, variables are really important in order to make the code more readable and to easily send you a whisper on Twitch. Oh, okay, that was a whisper. Uh, have no idea how whispers work. Please, if it was something that everyone can benefit, please uh, write it here because in order to look at whispers on Twitch, I probably need to go outside of the chat application and go somewhere else. It's pretty, pretty difficult. Um, okay, so what is the problem with variables? The problem with variables is naming them. As you can see, I struggled a lot in, um, in naming these variables. In fact, uh, people usually say that there are two hard problems in computer science. And one of them is naming things. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Cache invalidation, I'm not talk, going to talk about this, but naming things is something that you already see. It's really, really important and difficult, in fact. It's really, really difficult to name variables. As you can see, I'm using a convention for naming variables, and this convention is camel case. In JavaScript, we need to use camel case. Camel case means that every word inside of this uh, variable name is lowercase, except for the initial of every other word, because this allows you to understand where the, the separator between the different words. There's also another convention called Pascal case, which is exactly the same as camel case, but it has an initial capital letter. So camel case is good, oh, camel case is good for, uh, for JavaScript. Pascal case is good for some parts of JavaScript, for example, if you want to specify classes, React components, etc., etc., we don't need to, to, to know them right now. There's also snake case. This is usually in Python or other languages, and we don't usually use snake case in JavaScript, except when we want to create some constants, so variables that never change. In that case, sometimes we use this snake case all capitalized and in fact you can see that the editor shows this this variable here with a different color it's uh, it's intended and uh, you cannot use kebab case because the dash here is not a valid separator for words in fact you can see that this case here looks um, a different color it looks like a as you can see, it has the same color of, of the keyword let, because case is actually a keyword in the JavaScript language. So this is not valid. And uh, what other conventions do we have? I think we are over. So this one, yes. This one, yes too, sometimes. This, usually no. This, yes, for constants and we are going to see what constants are. This, absolutely not. Okay, I have to, okay. And since all of this is not good code, and if I save it, the code will break, I'm going to put everything inside of a block of comments in order to have this information available on my in my code base, okay? So these are the conventions. I can also write this. Uh, naming conventions. Okay, so this is some code that I'm typing and leaving for the developer, not for the computer, because the computer will never understand what this is about. Jabata, so Bobby says, since we are on summing strings with numbers, I was prompting you to explain how the sum 2 plus 2 is 4, but string 2 plus string 2 is 22, and strung, string 2 plus string 2 minus string 2 is 20. This is a good question. I'm going to answer it as soon as we go to this next section. So don't worry, I'm going to reply. Uh, it's a pretty interesting part of JavaScript. Uh, someone say that it's uh, a quirk, it's something really strange with JavaScript, but I find it 
lovely. I love how JavaScript does this kind of things. If you understand them, then it's really uh, a powerful, a powerful feature of JavaScript. It's not a bug, it's a feature. So let's see what does JavaScript info say about variables. You can declare a variable by saying let message. Let is a keyword that means, well, let, let there be light, let x is be equal uh, zero, okay? So let is, well, actually um, a, a word, uh, a verb in English, let message. And you can then assign a value to the variable on a separate statement, just like this. Hey, wait a second, I'm not placing any semicolons. <laughs> I, I was just saying before that I wanted to put semicolons everywhere and I never put one semicolon. And, but as you can see, it's not really that important because semicolons are optional in JavaScript. But still, I would love to be as uh, uh, precise as possible and use semicolons. Total fruit, still 38. Everything works. Okay. So you can declare a variable in a statement and assign a value to this variable on a separate statement. And then you can print the, the name of the variable. This is really important and I already stressed this uh, a while ago. There's a, real, there's a huge difference between saying alert total fruit and alert the string total fruit. The difference, you told me already last time, is that here I'm alerting the value associated with this variable. But here I'm just alerting the string which says total fruit. So in this case I will see total fruit, in this case I will see 38, which is the result stored inside of this variable. There is a huge difference and in fact here I'm exploiting this difference by showing some uh, static uh, message concatenated with some dynamic value that was computed. Um, here you can see an example in which the variable is defined and assigned in the same line, in the same statement. And it's exactly what we've done so far in here. First, we declared and assigned in two statements. And here too, we have to put semicolons everywhere. But um, at a certain point, we decided to declare and assign in the same statement, which is what we are doing here. Uh, you can even do more than one declaration in the same statement. So, for example, let user is equal to John, comma, age is equal to 25, comma, message is equal to hello. But they say it, and I say it too, we don't recommend it. Don't do this. It's not... Uh, it's not a good practice. It's much better to declare and assign each uh, variable in a separate statement. You can use the multi-line style. You can use the one, uh, only one statement and separate with, uh, um, with a new line. But still, it's not really that good. Uh, some uh, uh, even put the comma on a new line, so everything is uh, perfectly aligned. But... What's the big deal in just repeating let three times instead of having to put this uh, extra comma in the right spot? Just create let user, let age, let message. So this is good code. This is, I don't want to say bad code, but we say usually smelly code. It's, uh, it's not stinking. It doesn't stink, but it has a strange smell and we don't like it. Okay? Uh, in old code base, you could probably see the keyword called var instead of let. In fact, variables uh, until uh, some time ago were declared by using the var keyword. Nowadays, we prefer let. And I think that nowadays there's no real reason to use var. If you think that you need to use the var keyword, then there's something wrong with your code base, probably. And we're going to see what is the difference between var and let. But for now, let's just ignore that var is, exists and let's just use let. 
If you still don't understand what uh, a variable is, this is an analogy that JavaScript Info tells you. I talked, uh, I told about labels. You attach a label to certain values. Uh, what they say here instead is that a variable is a box and the box contains a value, which is pretty much the same. So you have a variable called message. The message contains a value called, uh, with, with a value hello. Let message is an empty box. If you do message is equal to hello, it means that the message now contains the string hello. But if you now assign a new uh, value to this variable, it means that the box will remove the old value and will contain the new value, which is something that we haven't seen before. But yes, the variables can be declared, you can assign an initial value, and you can reassign other values. For example, I can say uh, bags of apples is equal to three. What does this mean? It means that at first I declared a bags of apples, which was two, but then I said, no, I want another bag of apples. So now bags of, bags of, bags of apples is equal to three. And this is the final value of this variable. So in this case, I will have three times four plus three times six. Uh, let's remove this because I don't care anymore. So the final result will be not this one, but 30, okay? Because 30 is three times four, which is 12, plus three times six, which is 18. 12 plus 18 is 30, good. I'm not really good in math. Uh, but still, as you can see, I am assigning a new value to the same variable. Some mistakes that uh, some inexperienced developers do is to use the let keyword in here too. This is not exactly the same meaning as you can imagine. This was declaring a new variable called bags of apples and assigning an initial value. And here with this other let keyword, I'm redeclaring the variable. And redeclaring a variable is usually not permitted. I cannot declare a variable that has already been declared. Uh, when I declare things, I declare them just one once and then I can assign values and change those values over time but the declaration is usually just one so I have to remove the declaring part and I'm just sticking with the assignment part which I can do over and over how many times I wish okay and uh, what else what else what else Oh, I can assign to a variable the value of some other variable. This is another thing that I can do. So, for example, in this case, if I want the bags of apples to match the number of bags of bananas, then I can say that bags of apples is equal to bags of bananas. As you can see, I'm saying that... I, th I hope that it, it, it's, it's understandable to you. Um... I'm saying that the number of bags of apples was two, but now I want it to be equal to the number of bags of bananas that I have. So right now the result is not 30, but 30. Yeah, of course, because it's exactly the same, uh, the same value as before. Okay, so I can assign as values of a variable the value of a different variable by just referencing it like this. Oh, this is what I've uh, showed you uh, right before. Uh, you cannot redeclare a variable. You can assign how many values you want, but you should not redeclare. You should declare only once in the same scope, in the same environment. All of this that I'm writing can be just copied and placed into Node. I can paste everything in here and I can ask node, what is the total fruit number? 30. So as you can see, even if in node, I don't have an alert that shows me on a pop-up the result, I can still ask node, what is the value of a variable by just naming it? And node will show me the result. Or if I want the whole text, like total fruit, blah, 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 I can just 
place all this code here without the alert because the alert is not available outside of the browser and I will see the string total fruit 30. Okay, so in Node I can still use this kind of code. In fact, there's another thing that I can do and I'm going to show you right away. Um, let's, for example, say something like this. Okay, I'm going to create a new file in here, hello world. Um, and I'm going to call it fruit, fruit.js. In fruit.js, I'm going to copy all of this code here. So I'm isolating the calculations. And uh, yeah, wait a second. And I can probably do another thing that I haven't shown you before. I can do a console log of uh, this thing here. So instead of alert, I'm using another statement here, console log, console dot log. So instead of alert, you write console dot log. What this, what this does um, is printing something on the console. And luckily the console is available both on Node.js because what you see here is the console and also on the browser because the developer tools on the browser do have a console and it's this one here. So if you use console log instead of alert, what happens now is that you can see exactly the same string of before, but not in a, with an annoying pop-up. You can see it right in the console in the developer tools. Of course, this is visible only to you, the developer, because usually users, when they go to your website, don't see the developer tools. So they will just see a blank page. Uh, the console is just for, for the hackers, for the developers that are able to open the developer tools and see the results on the console. And the same goes with uh, Node.js. So I'm going to enter again in Node.js and I'm going to take all these, uh, all this code with a semicolon. And I'm going to paste all this code inside of the terminal. And I can see that total fruit is 30. So the statement console log is logging on the console. And this works exactly the same in here. Uh, moreover, if I say uh, 30, this will be returned as 30 here. If I do console log 30, the result is very similar. It's just prints 30, but it then also says undefined. And this is something that I haven't explained yet, but bear with me. So I can use console log both in the, on the browser and on Node.js. Why am I showing you this? Well, because with JavaScript right now, we already have the chance to create our first programs, our first scripts that work on the terminal instead of on the browser. In fact, let me quit Node with Control D and clear the console. Now I'm going to CD, so to change directory and move myself, place myself in the same directory in which I have this fruit.js file. So it's in uh, projects, in Glorious Coders, Academy, in Glorious Portfolio. Uh, 10 JS fundamentals and here we are. It should be here. LS. No, nope, it's in Hello World. <laughs> I have to go into Hello World 2. LS. Now I see fruit.js. Okay. I went really fast, but because we spent a lot of time in uh, knowing how to CD, LS, etc, etc. So you should be able to do the same yourself pretty easily by now. So now I can start again Node. But this time, instead of just pressing enter, I'm adding one argument to the node application, to the node program. And I'm going to tell him to parse, read, evaluate fruit.js. So node space fruit.js, press enter, total fruit 30. So now I have a program 
from the command line that I can run from the command line that does some calculations and just gives me the result of these calculations. Of course, this is a really basic program. In fact, I would probably want this program to accept some input in order to do some calculations, uh, some different calculations, instead of uh, just changing the, val the values of the variables inside of, of the script. But still, this is already a program in which I can tweak these variable values and it will perform some calculations and with this node through JS I will have the results of my calculations. Um, one last uh, refactor of this. I would love to have something called something like the, the sale of a bag of apples. So we can say that this is the apples quantity this is the apple price so an apple costs four <laughs> and uh, we have two apples uh, then we have the bananas quantity and the price of a banana banana price okay um no, i don't care anymore about this i'm going to comment it out and here i have to say this is the sales total for example the sale totals is the quantity of apples times the price of a single apple plus the quantity of bananas times the price of a single banana. Uh, if you want, you can do the same as I was doing before, which is uh, putting everything onto a new line. I'm not really suggesting you to do this, but maybe this improves readability for, for some. And this is the sales total, so I'm going to use this uh, variable in here. And this is not the total fruits anymore. This is the total sale, the sale total. I don't know. <laughs> I should have prepared better this part. <laughs> okay, so this is already an application that allows me to calculate the sale total, sales total, sale total. Let's say sale total. Um, the sale total of my grocery list or something like that. The sale total apparently is 26. So I can just uh, put the values in these variables or add more variables in here and then just leave the, the calculation to the computer and the computer will show me the results of these calculations, of these computations. And that's it. It's not really a beautiful uh, application he that we have here, but the more sentences and the more keywords that we learn, the more we will be able to make this application uh, m more dynamic and, uh, and, and nicer and more useful, maybe. Still everything is fine? Yep, okay. So as you can see, it is really, really important to understand variables. And it is really, really important to do this kind of uh, exercise that I was doing so far. I was refactoring my code by changing the name of a variable and all of its occurrences. And I am experienced, so I didn't incur in any problems. But it's really, really easy to mistype something like you have let sales total but here you leave it sale total. What happens if you make a mistake such as this one? Boom, an error. It says that sale total is not defined as a variable. How is it not defined? Can't you see it's here? It, it looks exactly the same. Well, it's not because this has an extra S that I'm overlooking. So it's really important that you make these mistakes see what the, bra what, the, what the computer complains about and try to make sense of the error messages that you find. Another good uh, way to spot these errors is to use the editor. In fact, if I click on a variable, usually other occurrences of these variables will be highlighted automatically. And if I don't see other occurrences of this variable highlighted anywhere else, I'm probably doing a mistake, okay? So this could be another good hint to, to write good code. I click on Apple's quantity and I see Apple's quantity being, um, being highlighted in here. The same goes with Apple price, banana's quantity, banana price. Everything is highlighted where I expect it to be highlighted. So everything is good. 
Sorry guys, but there's a phone ringing. So wait a second. How do I... How does it work? I have no idea how this works. Um, okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, okay, as you can see, uh, variables are already pretty tricky and you have to make exercises on them as soon as you can, as much as you can. And there is a, a section about variable naming because it's really, really important to name variables the correct way. Those two variable names are valid. Username in camel case or test123. You can put numbers inside of a variable name. Um, sometimes you, you, you use it because you have to say, for example, let number one and let number two. Let number one is the number three, let number two is the number two, and then let sum is number one plus number two. So you see that I'm putting numbers in variable names, but just to take track of, uh, of which variables I have. I could also call them uh, a number and another number, and this is exactly the same. Well, I don't like it that much, but still, I can use these variable names, making sure that I change every occurrence, of course, uh, so I can get rid of these uh, numbers in the, in the variable name. Um, it is really important that you don't start with a number in the variable name. I think that that doesn't work. Yeah, cannot start with a digit. You cannot use kebab case. And it's really, really important that you don't use any special characters such as the dollar symbol or the underscore symbol or other symbols that are allowed, but it's better not to use them because usually these symbols are already used by someone else. In fact, if you go to the browser and you say dollar and press enter, you see that this variable already has a value, and this value is an F dollar selector start node command line API. So this is a variable that already exists on the browser. So it's much better if you don't declare a variable called dollar, because otherwise you're risking to redeclare the variable called dollar. Let's see, uh, let dollar equal to three. Now dollar is equal to three but I cannot use the dollar that was already defined by the browser, which probably was useful to me. In fact, this dollar, if I remember correctly, is a way to get a reference to the body. But this doesn't work, but if I comment out this and I try again, nope, uh, sorry, I had to quote. Okay, if I type dollar string body, I have a reference to the body element in the HTML. But if I redefine the dollar as the number three, saying dollar body is giving me an error. So naming variables with special characters like dollar or underscore is really, really dangerous because you could be overriding functionalities that are provided by your environment or the libraries that you are using. So just stick with the simple names in camel case with meaningful words and sentences. Don't create names that are too long because when they are too verbose, they are completely, uh, they are very difficult to read. This is already pretty difficult to read because it, it, it's, made, it's just a, a, a small calculation, but with long, long words. Uh, but still, it's really important to name the variables in a proper way. You can use X and Y. That's fine. But why X? Why Y? Is X and Y related to points, uh, to coordinates of a point or uh, axes in, uh, in a Cartesian system? Or they are just placeholders for generic names? Maybe I can say N1 and N2 which could be a shorthand for number one and number two. This is fine, but what if N can mean something else? Um, I really don't know what, can, what other things can it mean, but uh, 
uh, I don't know, nerd number one and nerd number two. Uh, or maybe num one, num two. This way you are just... Uh, you are removing B, E, and R, so three words, three characters from the word number. Is it worth it? Is it better to say num1 instead of number one? Sometimes you can feel it is, sometimes not. Um, if you want to easily rename variables, there are multiple ways to do it. The way I like it best is to click on a variable name and then do control D, which will highlight the whole variable. And with other, another control D, I'm, it's going to highlight automatically the next occurrence of this variable. And if you do control D or command D on Mac enough times, you will probably select all the possible occurrences in the same file. And in this case, you can just type number one and you will see every occurrence change at the same time. This will allow you not only to uh, be more productive in renaming variables, but also to avoid mistakes, because this way you are pretty sure that if you change the name of a variable, no other variables will be left out. So I can do the same with num2. I can select num2. I control D multiple times. And now you have the carrot in two different selections and you can write number two. Uh, and it will uh, do the same in both occurrences. Then you can just press ESC or click anywhere else to, ha to, to go back to the one carat uh, situation. Okay, I think we can stop here with variables and we can go with other cool things. Of course, there are some reserved names. Uh, don't name a variable let. Don't name a variable return. Don't name a variable case let case is equal to five. Well, case, yeah, probably case works for some reason, but let return, no, no, I don't think so. Let case is equal to five, let's see. Uh, but this is fruit and I have to put it on another file. I hope that I'm not confusing you too much with all my uh, changes, really quick changes. If I am, please tell me. You see, unexpected token case. So the editor was not telling me, but I shouldn't use the, a spe the special keyword case for a variable. And the same goes with let, let, let. Nope, let is disallowed as a lexically bound name. And the same goes with let return. Nope, cannot use it. And there are some other special keywords like default probably. Yep, default is not allowed. How do you know which keywords are allowed or not? Well, you have to study all of JavaScript because in JavaScript we will see all these keywords one by one. We will see what is a switch, a case, default, return. We already saw let, of course. Uh, we will see for, for, re uh, yeah, for a while, etc., etc. So just um, bear with me and with time you will know what names you cannot use because they are already uh, valid keywords in JavaScript. Um, this is not really that important. Um, so let's talk about constants. I already told you that a variable is uh, a container, a, a box or a label for a value and you can reassign a value to the variable. That's why it's called a variable because it can vary its value. But there is another class of uh, elements that we can use here, which are constants. And constants are just like variables, but you declare them with const instead of let. And this adds an extra feature which discourages you and gives you an error if you try to assign a new value to the constant. So this is really important for things that should not be allowed to change. If you create, um, let's say, let pi is equal to 3.14. This is the number pi that you probably already know. But then you say that pi is equal to 1. Not true. Pi has a value of 3.14 something else. It's not really that 3.14, but we cannot do more, much more than that. And you should not, never, 
change the value of pi to something that doesn't uh, that is not even close to the real value so if I console log pi or maybe I can even do some text since you already know how to do it pi let's put it like this and you can see that pi is 1 no it's not uh, maybe some developer make it, made a mistake and they assigned a value 1 to pi and I want to discourage the developer which is usually myself to do this kind of mistake so I'm going to say that const pi is 3.14 and now I have an error because I'm trying to reassign a new value to a variable which is not variable, it's constant. So, oh, oh yeah, of course, I cannot reassign a value to pi. I'm going to just uh, mute this thing or delete this thing. And now pi is successfully 3.14 and will always stay the same. As you can see, as soon as I started calling this a const, pi changed color. Uh, I had a color whitish, grayish, but if I say const, pi becomes yellowish. And this is a help from the editor that tells you that pi is not a variable, it's a constant. And when I deal with constants, with constants usually it is a good practice to use the all capital uh, snake case convention. So pi underscore number, or just pi. Uh, it's not always like that, I'm going to tell you. It's not always like that. In fact, uh, sometimes you just want variables that never change, uh, like these ones here, for example. And in that case, you just call them const banana is a bag, and that's it. You don't uh, also put them all in uppercase, snake case. You don't, you, you don't care about that. Usually the uppercase here is used for uh, meaningful constants like pi or like the screen width or uh, some colors. For example, const default color is equal to white. So in that case, you usually use this convention. But you know, of course, you can use also default color. And that's, that's normal, that's cool too. As you can see, I used default, which I already told you it's a reserved keyword. But I, don't, I didn't just say default, I said default color, which is a whole word. So in that case, I can use the word default if it's combined with some other word. I cannot use, I cannot say const default, but I can use default color. But still, in this case, I'm probably going to use the snake case convention like this, default colors. Um, let me see if everything is good. Yes, the chat is silent, but not because of problems. Awesome. Okay, uppercase constants. Okay, <laughs> I'm always going a little uh, before the... the, the well, it, it's good like this, because I don't want to just follow blindly the tutorial. I want to give you a little bit of my uh, take on, uh, on what you are going to read by yourselves. In fact, remember that at the end of our lessons, you should always read this reference material and practice on this reference material. So, as you can see, they used constants for, for example, colors. So, color red, color green, color blue, color orange. And they used the snake case convention for these constants. Uh, but not always. In fact, this const my birthday is not using this convention. And it's fine. It's uh, totally fine. Um, what else? For instance, page load time, blah, blah, blah. Name things right. There's uh, an important paragraph about naming things right. And I think it's going to say pretty much the same, same things that I already told you uh, right now. So, for example, you can use names like A, B or C. But since they are not really that meaningful, it's much better if you instead use username or shopping cart or other meaningful names that give meaning to you, not the computer. Because for the computer, A is exactly the same as username, but A is pretty not understandable by you. So just, just use username instead of A if you want to specify a username, okay? Um, reuse, recreate, summary, blah, blah, blah. These are tasks that you should perform. We will perform them next Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday at 
I said 5.30 p.m. UTC, if that's a good time for you. Of course, Twitch records all these lessons, so if it's not a good time for you, you can still see the recording. But as always, I think it's much, much better if you see these uh, streams live. I usually see about 7 to 15 uh, online viewers watching live with me, and then about 200 viewers offline. I don't know if those viewers offline are just uh, Twitch bots or are just viewers that see my stream in the showcase of Twitch and then just uh, don't see uh, any more than, uh, than that, that second that they see. But still, online viewers and offline viewers, please keep in touch with me on Discord especially and on Slack if you need to. Uh, the invitation link, you can find it here... And I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to copy it in the chat again uh, here. Should work. And uh, please do the exercises. Please give me feedback. It would be awesome for me to know a little more about you and what uh, and how you are experiencing these lessons. So these are tasks about working with variables, declaring variables, assigning values, copy values, showing the values, and probably are, oh, they're using alerts. But if you want to, I gave you one extra uh, tool, which is the console log, which is a little better than the alert because the alert is this blocking pop-up. Well, console log is... Uh, it's just showing you things inside of the console. It's a little better. Um, what else? Then giving the right name, uppercase const. So some tasks that are really, really useful. They are really well done. So I encourage you to try them. Then, finally, we will be able to reply to Bobby's question about uh, why do, does uh, adding and subtracting yield to different uh, results. Well, you already saw that we can use uh, numbers or these strings of texts. Well, these are two uh, specific data types that we can use in JavaScript. This is a data type called a number and this is called a string. I already told you this is a string. Don't say text. This is a string. Um, the cool thing about JavaScript is that it's a dynamic dynamically typed language, which means that I don't need to specify the type of this variable. JavaScript already understands that this variable is a string because I assigned a string value to it. Other languages such as Java or C Sharp are not dynamically typed languages and they are statically typed languages, so you have to specify the type of variable. So usually in uh, Java or C Sharp you have to write string default color is white and uh, uh, float pi is equal to 3.14. So you declare variables by also stating their type in other languages other than JavaScript. There is, I already mentioned it, um, a superset of JavaScript called TypeScript developed by Microsoft that adds static typing to your variables. So you can use something like const default color of type string, const pi of type number. Oops, sorry, of type number. Uh, this is what one of the features that TypeScript adds to your variables, uh, to, to your code. I don't like it. I like the fact that JavaScript doesn't need to specify these types. But this is just my personal opinion. There's a lot of people out there that really benefit from static typing. So instead of JavaScript, they usually prefer using TypeScript. And with a transpiler, they translate the TypeScript code into JavaScript code, which means that the transpiler just removes all these type the definitions and leave the JavaScript as it is. So it's not a big deal using TypeScript. It doesn't change completely your code. It just allows you to add some extra hints in your code about the types of uh, the different variables. And then as soon as you transpile your code, it becomes plain JavaScript. TypeScript is not only doing this, of course, but one of the features is this one. But another cool thing about JavaScript is that it also has it's not only dynamically typed, it's also weak 
typed. And I don't know if we can find uh, some information about that. Oh, there's something on Stack Overflow, but probably another cool thing is on Wikipedia. Hmm. Not sure. Okay, so the difference, I'll tell you. The difference is this. If I say let, um, let my var is equal to 5 in a dynamically typed language, I don't need to specify the type because this language already understands that this variable is a number. In statically typed numbers, in, uh, languages instead, I have to specify it explicitly like uh, this. Let my var of type number is 5. I have to write this type. This is statically typed. This is dynamically typed. But a dynamically typed language usually also allows you to redefine, reassign a new value, but it should keep the same type. So if let my var is equal to 5, my var is necessarily a number. And I can assign a new value, for example, 10. But I cannot assign a generic, another type. This instead is possible in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can assign a value with a completely different type, and you can even compare two different types. In fact, you can even do something like 2 plus 2, which means I'm adding a string with a number, which is usually impossible in other languages. You either use the plus symbol between two strings and it will concatenate those two strings or it will uh, you, it will work for uh, two numbers so 2 plus 2 is equal to 22 because these are two strings and the plus between two strings concatenates those two strings 2 plus 2 as numbers without the quotation marks is equal to 4 because this plus understands that it's between two numbers so it must add the two numbers together well in JavaScript unlike other languages this 2 plus 2 can be done and it probably yields to 22 just like the concatenating but we can try we can try it on the fly in our console on Node.js or even here on Chrome. So I can just uh, copy and paste the 2 plus 2 strings and it will give me 22. If I do 2 plus 2 as numbers, it will give me 4. And if I try 2 as a string plus 2 as a number, it still gives me 22. Other languages will tell you, no, this is an error. You're trying to add a string to a number. And this is not possible in strongly typed languages. But JavaScript is weak, is weakly typed, is a weakly typed language. It's, it's, it's not weak as a language, it's, it's very powerful. Because it doesn't really care about the types. It tries to interpret uh, the types and to do the best out of it. So in this case, uh, one of the two types is different. What JavaScript uh, decided to do is since one of them is a string and the other is not, let's convert this number into a string and these two will be concatenated as strings. It's not a, because of the order. In fact, if I change the order, it's still 22. So it's not taking the type of the first element. It's just trying to understand this is a plus, but a plus between a string and a number is not possible. So I'm, not going, uh, so I'm going to convert the two into a string and then I'm going to concatenate these two strings together. But this goes well with the plus, because plus means either summing numbers or concatenating strings. What about the minus symbol? So if I do 2 minus 2, well, this is a mathematical operation, so 2 minus 2 is 0. But what if I try to do... Uh, a, my, uh, a subtraction between two strings. Uh, in this case, JavaScript is not able to subtract a string from another. It has no sense. We could probably try to make sense of this. In fact, the string 2 minus the string 2 could be an empty string with no 2s inside. But this is not what JavaScript does. Uh, instead, 
since the subtraction uh, is performed only on numbers, JavaScript makes an effort to convert this string and this string into numbers. So the string 2 and this string 2 becomes two numbers too, and, it, and the result is 0. So finally, Bobby, why 2 plus 2 is 4, string 2 plus string 2 is 22, and this is the most important part, the string 2 plus the string 2 minus the string 2 is 20. What happened here? Well, the reason is that this plus can be interpreted as a concatenation between two strings, but this cannot be interpreted as a concatenation of two strings. This is necessarily a, subtractions, a subtraction between two numbers. So what is happening right now is that th this operation is converted, let's say, into... Uh, let's put some parentheses like this. So the subtraction has higher priority over this concatenation symbol. So this will result in uh, having 2 minus 2 because the subtraction will automatically convert the two strings into two numbers. And so we will have 2 plus 0. But now since the plus can be also interpreted as a concatenation between two strings, this will also be interpreted as two, string 2 plus string 0. And that's why we have 20. This looks like a crazy hell for developers coming from other languages, but if you're used to how JavaScript works, and if you're used to weak typing, this makes a lot of sense. I don't want to say that it's useful. It, it probably isn't that much useful. Instead, you have to probably make sure that you are adding and subtracting the proper types and you're not mixing apples with oranges. But still, the fact that you have this extra feature of weak typing, so being able to mix different types together and JavaScript will try its best to, to do what, what it can do with those variables, uh, it's a cool feature and you can probably use it sometimes. Okay, so a dynamic language allows you to, well, actually, probably I, I didn't say it well. Uh, a dynamic language usually allows you to not specify the type. The type is derived by the value. So a dynamic language allows you to declare a variable giving a value with a certain type, for example, string, and you can even reassign a new value with a different type. Uh, probably I... I said it um, wrong uh, a while ago because I said that was a feature of, uh, of weak, uh, weak type languages. Let's see Python. In Python, I can, instead of let uh, in, to declare variables, I can just say num is equal to 2. So in Python, there's a small difference. In Python, you don't even need to use the keyword let. This is already working. Uh, and if I say that num is the string hello, this works. Uh, so I can use, in a dynamic language such as Python, uh, I can use a variable by, and I can declare it without really declaring it. When I assign it a value, it's automatically declared. This is a difference that we have in Python compared to JavaScript. And I can assign a value with a different type. But can I say 2 plus... 2, yes, it will be a concatenation in Python. Can I do 2 plus 2 as numbers? Yes, I can do it in Python. Can I do 2 plus 2 as a number? No, I cannot. This demonstrates, this proves that Python is a dynamic language, a dynamically typed language, but it's not a weakly typed language. In fact, it's not able to uh, sum or concatenate or mix together two elements, two values with different types. JavaScript instead is able to do that. So it has a little more power compared to other languages. And I'm not going to show you anything in static, statically typed languages right now, but if you want to, I can probably provide you some examples if you, if you really ask me. Okay, so what kind of types do we have? We have the number, which is already pretty cool because in the statically typed languages, we don't have just number. 
in statically typed languages such as Java or C Sharp, there's not just a generic number. We have to specify if this number is an integer, so uh, like three or one to three, with no floating, with no decimals. Or if it's a float, in statically typed languages, we have the type float that uh, allows you to specify numbers with floating points, so with decimals. And sometimes you want to use more or fewer bits in order to specify a number. So we don't only have a, an int, we, only ha we also have a long type, which is an int that allows you to add more uh, bigger numbers because it has more bytes uh, available uh, to, to describe this number. And the same goes with float. You can use double to double the precision in order to have uh, a number with, with floating point with decimals, but more decimals. Uh, all of this is completely um, abstracted out in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you just have number. And with the type number, you can put integers or decimals with an arbitrary precision. Well, there is a, a limit to the precision, but still, you can just use number and you're good to go. And the same goes with other languages such as Python. So, uh, much easier. But a little less performance. In statically typed languages, if you can have control on the size of your uh, uh, numbers, then you can probably achieve a higher performance. Um, but we don't really care about that amount of performance in, uh, in JavaScript or in Python or in other languages which are higher level. Um, there are some special numbers there. For example, if you divide one by zero, you get a special number called infinity. And infinity, of course, it's, a, it's probably not to be considered even a number. And I'm not going to tell you the mathematical implications of infinity, but still, we have infinity. And what if you try to do a not uh, a, an unconventional mathematical operation such as dividing a string by a number? Well, this will tell you, will, this will yield a NAN, which is, stands for not a number. So it's just uh, a number that is not actually a number. There's an error in the calculation, so this, is, this cannot really be interpreted as a number. Let's go on after the break, which will be for just five minutes this time. So it's 12.01 my time, and let's get back to work at 12.06. Have a nice coffee break. Bye.
a few moments later. Here I am. Hi. Oh, the chat is uh, is dead. Let's see if this works. Okay, <laughs> the chat works again. Um, so I hope you enjoyed your coffee. I didn't because I didn't want to get another coffee. I'm already too hyperactive. Um, so. I hope that I'm not confusing you too much by talking about JavaScript and also related languages. I'm doing this uh, not because you should know it, but because I want to give you some more information that is not uh, provided in these, uh, in these tutorials. And because I'm assuming that some of you already know one programming language and maybe want to understand better the difference between this programming language and others. And also I think that um, well, if you know the differences between different programming languages, you will learn JavaScript, but always keeping in mind that there are some other languages that behave pretty much the same with some slight differences. And as soon as you will start coding in Python or in Java or C Sharp or whatever, you will already feel quite at home because you will be used already to the slight differences that uh, you will face. Um, Python is a really important language because it's uh, widely used by data scientists and uh, for AI, machine learning, even for quantum computing. And recently I stumbled upon a game engine called Godot, which is an open source game engine, really fast. And this game engine allows you to write code in a Pythonish language. So as soon as you understand how coding works in general, it will be pretty easy for you to learn some other language. In fact, I didn't even know too much about Python before writing uh, a, a, a small game for, with, this, uh, with this game engine. But still, uh, really, really easy to understand, the, to, to, to write in any programming languages. As far as you understand the uh, basic concepts behind, and uh, you can understand the small nuances between different languages. Everything is cool, right? The stream is going on, the audio is fine, and so we can go back to business. So we saw how to do an hello world, we saw the code structure, meaning the statements, the possibility to add semicolons or not, and I usually <laughs> miss them and uh, different kinds of comments. Then we saw that we can use apply the modern mode, but I'm not suggesting you to use it. And we started to go with variables. Uh, as for interaction, um, there should be some. Uh, probably I put this interaction thing for some reason at that place. No, it's right after data type, so I'm not going to tell you anything about interaction for now. As for data types, there are some uh, data types that we have to explore. There are not many, luckily. There are ma much, many more data types in other languages. But in JavaScript, usually, it's uh, just a bunch of them. It's strings, numbers, and you can have also not a number, uh, an infinity, and other things. Uh, this is a new type that I never used before, and it's the big int. Uh, but I'm not really sure that we need to know this. In fact, big int is a new thing, and uh, it's not even compatible with every browser. So if you're targeting Internet Explorer, for example, Internet Explorer doesn't have the big int type. So just go with ints. You can recognize easily a big int from an integer because you will have a final n at the end of the number. You see it here? But I don't think you need to know big int. Just need to know that it exists, and as soon as you need it, you will be able to use it. I personally never used big int in my whole JavaScript career, which started in, 12, in 2012. So I started learning JavaScript eight years ago, nine years ago now, and I never used a big int in my life. String. String is pretty important and we have to see a little bit more about this uh, data type because it's uh, one of the most important that we have. So new folder data types 
and I'm going to create a new file called, uh, I don't know, data types, JS. This is my new file in which I will do some uh, experiments on data types and I would like to either run them on the browser, but it's uh, quite difficult to run them on the browser because you have to put the JavaScript inside the HTML page. Or you can, as you can see, wait a second, as you can see, we can start using instead the... Um, okay, I'm typing bad code. Wait, is, wait a second. Oh, I placed it in the wrong place. I want to place data types inside of JS fundamentals, not instead of hello world. And I can not seem to be able to do it from Visual Studio Code. Whoa, what can I do? Well, pretty easily. Uh, either I use the file system, uh, file explorer, or I remember the commands that I can place on the terminal. So I'm in hello world. I have the data types folder in here. I want to move it one folder up. I'm going to use move data types up one folder to the parent folder. Bam, just one command. And now data types is where I want it to be. Bobby says, begint is usually used with some tokens uh, slash key algorithms in order to assign 248 bit value or so I'm told. Yes, but um, usually when I deal with tokens uh, for authentication, etc., I'm not using begins. Uh, we usually use the so-called JWT standard, which actually deals with strings. So you have this, uh, you have this kind of uh, of key, which, as you can see, it's not a number; it's a string, and this string has a deep meaning that you can then uh, uh, inspect. So for tokens, I don't usually use begins. And uh, when I say I don't, I would like to say we don't. We JavaScript developers don't usually use begins to create tokens. We usually use this kind of strings. So strings, uh, we saw that a number can be written as uh, one, two, three, which is an integer number. Or, you know what, let's call it int. I think I can even call it integer because integer, I don't think it's a reserved word. Let's say, let's see, uh, no data types. Ah, oh, come on, I'm still here. So I have to go back to data types and then no data types. Okay, no error so far, nothing uh, printed because it will only print if I do some console log. If I do console log integer, then in that case, I will have this integer printed. So I can use the name integer to for a variable because it's not a reserved keyword. Maybe integer with a capital I could be reserved, I don't remember, who cares? And we can have a floating point number by just specifying 123.456. And this is a floating point number. Uh, let's see what happens if I console log this floating point. 123.456, and this is a floating point, but still a number. These are all numbers, so I can just place them all in the section numbers. Let's have a look instead at strings. Well, there is just one kind of string, but the string can be created in multiple ways, at least three of them. So let single quote is a variable that will show me a string created with single quotes. But as you know, I can also use double quotes. And this behaves almost exactly the same as a single quote. I can console log the single quote and console log also the double quote and let's see what happens of course it will still console log whatever I have up but you can see single quotes double quotes everything is logged correctly uh, I did one thing that I did, I haven't explained before and this is out of habit console log have this has this cool feature compared to the alert 
that you can place whatever variables uh, you want to print separated by commas and console.log will automatically concatenate these values separating them by a space. So instead of doing console.log and then console.log like this, which will show you the two strings one after the other, uh, we can place all of this in one string by either concatenating them in a special way like this, single quote plus a space plus double quote, which will give you this, or console log already has this feature in which you can just separate them by a comma and you will see them all um, one next to the other separated by spaces. And as Bobby tells, Thanks a lot, Bobby. I'm again missing semicolons, which as you can see, it's not really that important because semicolons are optional in JavaScript. But if you want to be strict, you have to use semicolons. Uh, if you remember, I showed you some Python. In Python, I didn't put semicolons. And in fact, if I remember correctly, in Python, semicolons are forbidden. Let's go to Python and I hey, say two plus three semicolon. No, oh, still works. So in Python, two, the semicolons are optional, apparently. Um, they are not forbidden, but still optional. Okay, so console log, single quote, double quote. And what's the difference between the two? No real difference. The only difference is that inside of single quotes, if you want to put some quoted text, allow quoted text, well, in that case, you can put quoted text with double columns and this will not give you any problem. But if you want to quote text with single columns, then in that case, you will have a problem because JavaScript is not able to understand if this uh, quote symbol is meant to quote this text or to end the string. In fact, as you can see, it looks like the string ended here, then we've got a couple of variables, and then we have an empty string with no characters inside of it. This is not what I wanted. I wanted to add some quoted text inside of the string. So what can I do is to escape these uh, symbols. If you remember what escape is, you can just do a backslash, not a slash, not a forward slash, a backslash in order to say that this symbol here is in this case a special character that I would like to print out. So quoted text, um, you can, we could say single quotes alike, uh, allow quoted text like this, or, or like this. Okay, I hope that it makes sense to you. I'm trying to write a whole sentence with both quoting ways. Single quotes allow, double allow, allow quoted texts like this with the escaped single quotes or like this with the double quotes. And uh, I probably should do a double console log. This way it will m be much easier to uh, tell the difference between the, the two kinds of uh, sentences. So single quotes allow quoted text like this, single quotes, or like this, double quotes. How do I achieve this? Well, if you're using single quote strings, you can use double quotes with no extra uh, hassle, or you have to escape any single quote you have. This is really important, especially when you're using the apostrophe symbol, right? And I think that's beautiful. Oh, this apostrophe needs to be escaped, otherwise it's not going to work. With double quotes, it's exactly the opposite. So you can allow quoted text like this with the single quote because it doesn't conflict uh, with, the, with the double quotes that I have describing the string or like this in which you have to escape the, the quotes. And in that case too, and I think that's beautiful, 
Well, you can see that with double quotes, you don't need to escape the apostrophe here. So let's see what's the results. Single quotes allow quoted text like this or this, and I think that's beautiful. Double quotes allow quoted text like this or like this, and I think that's beautiful. As you can see, those two strings behave exactly the same on the outside. But on the inside, you can see that there is a slight difference. And the bottom line of this is that if you have a string that doesn't need any apostrophe, you usually prefer to use single quotes. Because it's, I don't know, better looking. If instead your string needs some apostrophes inside, then maybe it's better to use double, double quoted strings. But it's actually more about your preference. Uh, I'm telling you the usual uh, guidelines, the usual formatting rules that I follow and they are pretty standard. So we usually prefer single quotes unless the string contains any apostrophe. In that case, we use double quotes. But there's another way to create strings, the third way. And this is really, really cool. This is a new addition that was added in ECMAScript 6 or ECMAScript number 2015, uh, which means that it was developed in 2015. So it's already five years old. And this is called usually template string or template literal. Template literal uses the back ticks. Back ticks is a special character that some of you probably already know pretty well because you use it uh, to add the grave accent to your, uh, to your vowels or to some of your consonants. But for some of us, the back tick is really uh, unknown and really difficult to, to add. In my case, uh, I have the chance with Linux to create backticks by pressing alt gr and the apostrophe symbol on my Italian keyboard. But this could not be your case. And especially if you're Windows, backticks are pretty difficult to achieve. So check your keyboard layout and check how to do backticks on, for example, Italian keyboard on Windows. I go here, Italian keyboard, how do I do the back tick? I read all of this and uh, there's a lot of things being said, too much. Type back tick on Windows Italian keyboard. So Okay, what they say is install <laughs> this uh, package, which allows you to do the same thing that I am currently able to do on Linux. So you, you press alt group plus the apostrophe and it will, it will give you the back tick. This uh, ETA dev keyboard that they show is pretty cool because in that case, it's also easy to create the tilde and also other important symbols. Uh, this is one of the solutions, but there's also another solution. If you have the uh, number keypad on your keyboard, you can try to do something like, well, tilde, okay, alt, you press alt, you keep press alt, and you type on the numeric keypad 152 in sequence. You should have also the num lock enabled, or Another way you can do the back tick uh, pretty easily is look for back tick on, uh, on Google. And wherever you find the back tick, you copy this code and you paste it on your editor. And th this works. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying this is the best way, but sometimes it's uh, probably the only way you can do it really, really fast. Maybe you can even put uh, a comment here, are made with, uh, as soon as you are able to, uh, to copy the back tick, you can copy it here in, on a comment and then you can paste it anywhere you want. I'm not saying this is the best way, but please try to find your best way to create backticks because backticks are pretty important nowadays in JavaScript since they allow you to create template literals. What is a template literal? A template literal, a template literal 
doesn't care about quotes. And as you can see, I'm using bad English. I'm using both single quotes symbols and double quote symbols without the need to escape them because there's no problem, uh, there's no um, overlap between the, 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 the quoting uh, notations. And allows to interpolate variables. What does it mean that you can interpolate variables? It means that instead of uh, creating a concatenation between uh, strings and numbers, you can do everything in the same string. Let's see how it works. So, first of all, let's console log this and uh, have a look at how does it uh, show. Let's go back to the terminal. I'm clearing everything. I'm showing you that single quotes are exactly the same as before, double quotes the same as before, and a template literal doesn't care about quotes. As you can, as you can see, I put both single quote and double quotes, and I didn't have to escape anything at all. So, pretty cool. But you can also interpolate, which means that I can do something like this. I can console log. I have four apples. What do you think will show here? I have the string I have plus the number four plus apples and semicolon. What happens if I render this? I see I have four apples. Oh, I forgot a space. I did it on purpose actually, but I forgot a space. I have to go back here and I have to put this extra space. And let's continue. And plus six plus space oranges. Let's see how it works. I have four apples and six oranges. Okay, I managed to concatenate strings and uh, numbers together and I had to pay attention to spaces. I had to pay attention where I put the pluses because if I'm not paying attention, maybe I can do something pretty wrong like this. This is not going to work because the plus is inside of the string. So it's not being interpreted as a concatenation. It's just going to print the string plus and then there's nothing between the string and the number. So I think this will go into an error. Yep, it's an error because there's no operator between the number and the string. I have to put a plus in here and remove the plus from the string. So as you can see, we need to practice a lot with these things because it's really, really easy to screw up. It's really, really easy to mess up with the, well, when you are coding. When I am coding, since I'm experienced, I will avoid most of the mistakes. But if you're coding by yourself, at first, you will do a lot of mistakes, just as I did a lot of mistakes in the early days. And I'm also doing some mistakes nowadays, actually. So it is really, really difficult to concatenate strings like that. Console log actually has a solution for that. In fact, you can use uh, this uh, feature that I was showing you to just uh, use commas to separate different bits, bits of... Um, uh, of strings and it will automatically concatenate them all together uh, for free. So this should work exactly the same. Not really the same. As you can see, the four and the six are different colors. Why is that? Well, because console log is logging the first piece, which is a string, and the second piece, which is a number, the third piece, which is a string, the fourth piece, which is a num piece, which is a number, and finally the string. So the console log is showing you that there is a difference between uh, the different parts of the string that you are printing. This is not printing a string. This is printing a string and a number, a string and a number, a string, it's, which is not exactly the same. So it's not exactly what we want. And uh, it still adds an extra space, which sometimes we do, don't even want. So what else we can do? And this is pretty daunting. So bear with me. I can create um, a sentence and I'm going to use the double, the, the back ticks in order to create this sentence. 
Um, first of all, I'm going to create the sentence statically. So I'm going to say I have uh, four apples and six oranges. And that's fine. I can console log. And this behaves like any other string. So console log the sentence with a semicolon. And this is fine. I have four apples and six oranges. But why am I doing this? Because I want this number four and this number six to be dynamic. So I can create two variables here. Let apples is equal to four. Let oranges is equal to six. And I can use those variables instead of the actual values. And as you understood, it's much easier like that to name things and to uh, change things uh, later on when you can uh, just change one value and all occurrences of the same variable will be changed accordingly. So instead of four, I'm going to write apples. Instead of four here, I'm going to write apples. And instead of six, I'm going to write oranges in both sentences. This should work seamlessly just like before. I just uh, uh, isolated somehow these uh, two values in their own variables. But what about here? I cannot just replace apples uh, with the variable name, right? Um, because this is a string, so uh, it's going to write whatever I type it in. I have apples, apples, and oranges, oranges. This is not what I want. What I want is instead replace the, this apples here as a placeholder with the value of the variable. So the syntax with template strings is to wrap the name of the variable with uh, curly braces. And I can do this pretty easily by either putting a curly brace here and a curly brace there, or what I love about Visual Studio Code and other editors of the like, I can double click to select all the variable and I can open a curly brace and it will automatically wrap the selected text in curly braces. And this is not over. We also need to prepend the opening curly brace with a dollar symbol. As you can see, the dollar symbol is pretty important and it's an important keyword in JavaScript. So as you can see, by placing dollar, open curly braces, and then something inside of it uh, and close the curly braces, we have a different syntax highlight here. And this is showing us that we somehow in the string opened a portal to the JavaScript world. In fact, here I can display not just uh, the, the variable value, I can type whatever I want in here uh, if it's valid JavaScript. For example, I can say I have apples plus three. This is a valid JavaScript statement. And what JavaScript will do, what the engine will do is to uh, execute this statement and whatever value, place it concatenated inside of the string. So if I do apples plus three, let's see what happens. I have seven apples because the number of apples was four, but now I added also three apples in this expression. I'm not telling you that you should do calculations in here. In fact, it's probably a best practice to not do any calculations in here. But you can now start doing this. You can interpolate JavaScript expressions inside of a string. So it's, this is why it's called a template string or a template literal, because you have a string which acts like a template with placeholders that will be replaced with the actual values of the variable that you define. And uh, this has exactly the same effect of uh, concatenating strings like this, but it's much easier. And another thing that uh, template literals have is that they can go on multiple lines. So a template literal doesn't care about quotes, allows to interpret variables, and allows for multi-line strings. You can do this. And you can also probably make the formatting a little better if you want to, something like that. Let's see if this works. Yup, it works, but still, as you can see, it keeps the tabbing effect. So if you don't want any tabbing like this, 
uh, you should remove all these uh, extra spaces, which uh, looks good on the on the output. Doesn't look really that good on the code. I don't really like the fact that this string is way on the left uh, at the same level of the st string declaration. Uh, we can fix this in multiple ways, but this is a cool feature of template literals. They allow multiple kinds of uh, symbols without the need of escaping. So you can put single quotes, double quotes. You can put multi-line strings, whereas here, if I go on a new line, the string is broken. And the only way I can place this on a new line is with a lot of effort. I will show you right away. And another thing is that template riddles allow you to, as we can say, interpolate variables. Oh, I already wrote it here, so don't need to, to specify a comment. So we can interpolate variables. We can mix variables inside, like sandwich pieces inside of the string. And this allows for a much easier concatenation. If you want to put a single quote, uh, the, the single quote string on new lines, well, you have to use a special character, which is the backslash n. Instead of the space, I'm going to put a backslash n in here, which, if you remember, means go to a new line. And here we've got a problem too, because on Windows, we don't have backslash n, we have backslash r return carriage. On Linux and Mac, we use backslash n. So sometimes you will see both of them being applied because backslash n will be ignored by Windows, which will not ignore the backslash r. And on Linux and Mac, they will use the backslash n and ignore the backslash r, which is so complicated. But with template literals, you just go to a new line and it just works. So you don't need, even need to care about this backslash n or r. I think that if you are on the Linux terminal or you know, the git bash on Windows, the backslash n should work pretty well because it uses the Unix convention. Uh, let's see what happens if I now add this backslash n. As you can see, the single quote string and the double quote string went successfully on a new line, but they don't show as a new line on the code, whereas the template literal shows as three lines. If you want it to show as three lines in here, you have to do something strange, like uh, uh, separating the strings into two strings, like this, by closing the first string and concatenating with the second string. And then in this case, you can put the second piece on a new line. As you can see, there's many things that you can do with the, with the rules that we already know. I haven't, uh, I, I'm not sh explaining you, oh, wait a second, I have to use the double quote here. See, <laughs> I'm messing up. Um, I'm not showing you any new rules in here. I'm showing you exactly the same rules as before, but uh, a, a different and more creative way to use this rule. Starting from the rules, I'm starting to define some strategies. What can I do with concatenation? Of course, I can concatenate uh, strings with numbers, but I can concatenate strings with other strings, and this allows me to place two pieces of strings in two different rows, if I really want to. And in this case, I'm doing it because I want to reflect the fact that this uh, string will be rendered in two lines, and I want to see it in two lines in here too. It is not sufficient, of course, to concatenate those two strings and put them in two different lines without the backslash n, because this means that these two strings are concatenated. I see them on two different lines in JavaScript, Whoop. but if I look at the rendering, there's no indication that one of the two strings should be on a new line. I have to remember that one thing is seeing a new line in the code, and one thing is telling the computer that it should show the next string on a new line for the user. So as you can see, I have to specify both the backslash n and also going on a new line, separating these two strings. All of this I'm saying, it's uh, probably also confusing, but all of this I'm saying to show you that you can be creative and define different strategies uh, given the few rules that I'm already giving you. And also, don't use uh, single quotes or double quotes if you want to go 
uh, in multiple lines. I really, really encourage you to use template literals uh, for multi-line strings because it's much easier and uh, it's less error prone and you can place single and double quotes as much as you want and you can easily interpolate variables. So I would say that template literals are the new way to do strings nowadays even though I saw that the usual conventional standard nowadays is to not use template literals everywhere. We still use single quotes for small uh, sentences, small strings that do not need an apostrophe inside. Uh, we use double quotes when we have small sentences that need an apostrophe inside. And we use template literal for everything else. So if we have uh, to interpolate variables, if we care about single and double quotes, and if we want multi-line strings. Okay, so the three different methods always create one kind of type and it's a string it's not three different kinds of strings it's just one string but three different ways to achieve the same result and this is it this is the double quote string on the tutorial this is the single quote string on the tutorial and this is the template string or template literal as we say and as you can see we can interpolate <coughs> any javascript expression by just using this dollar uh, curly braces and uh, whatever JavaScript expression we want. In this case, as you can see, we are interpolating the value hello. So this will uh, uh, lead to the result can embed another hello. And the spaces are automatically there uh, if you place them in the template string. I hope this is uh, clear. If it's not clear, we will practice next Wednesday and we will make it more clear, probably. As you can see, you can place a variable name, but you can also put any JavaScript expression, for example, one plus two. And here, the tutorial tells you a really, really important pitfall, a really important gotcha. What if you try to create another sentence? And this is a string in which I have, I have apples, apples, and you try to console log, another sentence. What do you think it will happen if I now execute this command here? I'll give you a few seconds. I would love this to be uh, more interactive. And we could make it more interactive. I cannot see your faces, your puzzled faces. What? But maybe I can hear your voice. And this is one extra feature that uh, Discord has. Discord has a voice channel. With the voice channel, I cannot see your face, but I can hear your voice. So you can uh, uh, tell me, uh, you can stop me with your voice and say, hey, hey, Anthony. No, I didn't get it. Please repeat this sentence. Uh, if you don't like typing, you can just speak. Please say something family friendly, <laughs> but still you can speak. So uh, th thanks Al, for joining. I see you, jo you joined. Awesome. Um, if you join Discord and if I see oh, or, or most of the students joining, we can probably experiment with this uh, uh, speaking channel. Um, I will probably do this uh, next Wednesday, not on Saturday, because I would like to go forward with the program with no, with no problems. Uh, but next Wednesday, if you tune in, we can try the speaking channel, which I never uh, experimented before. Uh, it would be lovely to hear your voice. I already heard uh, some of your voices because I had one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with some of you. Uh, but in this case, we can hear your voice um, and share it. Okay, so Tiago says that this is not going to work. Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by working. Maybe it works as I intended. Maybe it works in a different way than what I intended. But you're totally right. It doesn't work. Meaning that I see I have apples, apples. What? Why is this not replacing the placeholder with the actual value because this dollar curly braces uh, syntax is available only with 
template literals. So this string must be quoted with backticks. Only with backticks this thing will work. If you're using instead single quotes or double quotes, this is not going to work. This is not going to interpolate. This is just a string that prints exactly what is written inside of it. And this goes for the double quotes too, if you don't believe me. Yep, I have ha apples, apples. So watch out because there's a huge difference between the single quote and the double tick. And sometimes you could overlook it because they look a lot like the same, but they're not. Okay, uh, there is no character type. Oh, this is another cool thing. There, in uh, statically typed languages such as C, C Sharp, Java, we also have another kind of, uh, of type, which is the character, which stands for one single character. And a string is just a concatenation of multiple characters together. In JavaScript, a single character is just a string containing one character, which is much simpler. So, there's only one type here for text. It's string. How easy is that? <laughs> I love it. There's an also another really important type, which is the Boolean. Uh, languages such as C do not have the Boolean type. Boolean means either true or false. And C never shipped with the Boolean type, as far as I know. I'm not talking about C sharp. I'm talking about plain C language. Uh, C usually uses numbers. The number one to say true, the number zero to say false. And this is pretty important to know because we have something similar here too. In fact, true is just a fun fancy way to say anything that is uh, different from zero. And false is a fancy way to say zero. True means yes, correct. False means no, incorrect. And this could be useful for some, uh, in some cases. For example, let's have a look at booleans. Oops, I'm gonna create a comment for a section called booleans. So, you know what? I'm going to comment out everything else because the output is starting to be pretty crowded. So I want to show you only what happens with booleans. And maybe one day we will go back to this code and uh, 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 find a way to show only the code that we want to show, uh, the results that we want to show without just commenting out things. So about booleans, I can declare a variable, which is, um, I don't know, um, am I happy is equal to true. I am happy. This is a variable that stores the, va the, the value of being happy. Let's, let's create another variable. Uh, I don't know. Am I... Am I tired? Also true. <laughs> let's... Um, is it afternoon? Let's say it's false because it's not afternoon right now. It's actually probably afternoon my time because it's past uh, noon, it's past 12 o'clock. Am I happy is always false for nine gaggers, lol. <laughs> You're right. Uh, nine gaggers are always unhappy and they don't have a girlfriend and they are salty. Uh, so, yeah, I can say that I'm happy. Tr well, I'm happy right now because I'm outside of 9gag, but as soon as this stream is over, I'll go back to 9gag and feel unhappy again. Uh, okay, so these are Boolean values, and uh, they look pretty useless right now. I can just uh, uh, console log them, of course, and uh, it's not going to be uh, an interesting console log. Uh, am I tired? Is it afternoon? Let's see what happens if I console log these values. Clear, no data types. True, true, false. Just showing me the value of these variables. So why is that that important? Well, for example, uh, the value true or false can be the result of some computation with some uh, comparison. For example, this is greater variable stores the result of comparing four with one. Four, is it greater than one? Probably yes, probably not. Let's try. 
let is for greater, I'm going to write a variable that is slightly different, is for greater than one, stores the results of comparing four with one. Is four greater than one? Let's find out. Console log is four greater than one. Let's see what the JavaScript interpreter says. Wait a second, I'm going to find it. It is true. Surprisingly, four is greater than one. Who would have known? Okay, and uh, of course, we will see some other logical operators later on, but there is the greater than, the minor, the, the less than, there's the equal, the greater than or equal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we stop here for now with Boolean values. There is another special value, the null value. The null value has a special meaning. And usually the meaning is uh, nothing, or empty, or I don't know the value. So the null value is pretty important usually, um, because it allows you to specify a variable whose value you don't know, or, or it's no value. For example, let's say, let's are you happy? Well, if I don't have feedback on your level of happiness, I'm going to say that the level of happiness is null. Uh, it's a Boolean value, maybe. Maybe it will be true or false one day, as soon as I have information. But for now, I don't know if you're happy. And the null value is telling me exactly this piece of information. Uh, I don't know. It's just a I don't know, no value. So no value or I don't know yet. Okay, so the null value is really, really important. Um, but there is also another type of value, which is particularly only for JavaScript. I never saw this kind of type in any other language, not even in Python, Ruby. It's the undefined value. And this is really, really strange and difficult. Wait a second before. Bobby says, so is it the null same as console read line? Does it require user input? Um, never told you anything about read line, and I'm not really sure that it ha that it is pertaining because read line in JavaScript, I don't even think there is a exists a read line in JavaScript, is it? Yeah, there is a read line probably. You know what? I never saw read line the read line function in my life. And I'm not going to, it's in Spider Monkey. Oh, in C Sharp, you say. Okay. Um, so, is the null the same as console read line? Does it require user input? No, null, it's, uh, it's not the same as read line in C Sharp. Read line is, I assume, it's a function that asks for user input and waits for user input. In this case, we're not talking about interacting with the user. We're just talking about variables that we declare, and they could have a Boolean value, a number value, a string value, or a null value, which means I have no value, and that's it. It's not going to require any, any user input. In fact, here I'm going to uh, log the value of are you happy, and without any user input, I just see that the value for now is null. So there's no user input involved right now. It's just a no value. Maybe one day I will have the value, and in that case I will need something like the read line that you are mentioning uh, in C Sharp. So the value for now is null, but then I'm asking uh, someone for uh, user input, and then I will know the value of are you happy, so I'll be able to reassign the value. So let's say that the user, user tells me they're happy, somehow, I don't know how, and then in that case, I'm going to say, are you happy will be equal to, let's say the user is happy, then the are you happy will be true. It was null before, now it is true. And let's see what the console tells me about. It is true. It was null, but then I asked the user if he's happy, and now it's true, okay? Pretty straightforward. But we also have this other, and um, I should probably say that this is not uh, related to booleans. In fact, uh, anything can be in boolean. I can have, uh, 
I want to know your age. The age? I don't know yet. But then the user gives me input or I calculate the age somehow. And in that case, I know that your age is 38, which is my age actually. Um, okay, so you can specify that a variable has no value at all. And then you can specify that it, has, it will have a value uh, later on, or it will always be without value. It could happen. So this is the null type. But in JavaScript, as I was saying before, there's another kind of type, which is the undefined. And undefined is peculiar of JavaScript. There's no other language that has undefined. And uh, it's actually pretty strange as a type because it looks a lot like null. There's a very slight difference. In fact, when you define a variable without ever assigning a value, such as let age, well, that age has a value, and this value is undefined. It's not null. When you do the same in other languages, when you declare a variable but do not assign a value, then the value is usually null or nil in Python. But in this case, when you don't assign a value, then the value is undefined. It's not null. Um, you can have a variable that has a value, and then you change the value to undefined, so the age will be undefined. Um, we don't recommend doing that, it says. Normally, one uses null to assign an empty or unknown value to a variable. Well, undefined is reserved as a default initial value for unassigned things. Um, well, the fact is that you have the ability to use null or undefined as you wish. You can decide in your own code base uh, what meaning to give to these two uh, variable, to, to these two kinds. I usually do something like uh, undefined means I don't know the value, while null means I have no value, which is slightly different. Um, let's see if I can find a proper example on that. Uh, probably not here on the spot. Um, well, we can say the same thing with are you happy? Are you happy can be true, if you're happy and you know it, uh, false if you're not happy, null if uh, I asked you and you are telling me I don't want to tell you, so I will say that the value of are you happy is null because there is no value for this. Or it could be undefined to say I haven't asked you yet. Uh, null is I asked you and you, did, and you told me I don't want to tell you. So the are you happy value will be null. But are you happy of undefined will just mean, will just mean that I haven't asked yet. I, I don't have a definition for this value. Null is a value. It means that I have no value. Maybe is a number divisible by zero could be a good uh, example. Um, could be undefined. Yes, but actually it could be anything. Um, if you say my number, this is undefined. Uh, I don't want to stick with the Boolean logic because null and undefined are not strictly related to Booleans. So you can see that if I declare a variable called my number and I and assign the value of undefined, the variable is actually undefined. And if I don't set it a value of undefined, well, the variable was already undefined because if I don't set um, a value, it is undefined. And then I can specify that my number is instead zero. Um, I can reassign the value so I don't need to declare it. Or I can say that my number is uh, 42, the, what, the most important number in, in the world for those who know it. Uh, it could be undefined, it could be zero, it could be 42, it could be null, which means I have... Oh, wait a second, you know what? This is not my number. This is my favorite number, okay? I wrote it in American, I'm gonna write it in English. Favorite number. My favorite number could be zero, could be 42, could be null, which means that I have no favorite number. I like them all. But if it's undefined, 
it probably means that I haven't yet specified which is my favorite number. But it's just a, a very small nuance. Maybe some libraries, some technologies, or yourself will not care about the difference between undefined and null, and then you will use undefined for everything or null for everything. So you can use null to say no value or I don't know, or you can use undefined to specify no value or I don't know, or you can say that null stands for no value and undefined stands for I don't know, or whatever you want. So this is a strange thing that we have in JavaScript. I don't know why we have this thing. Uh, there's no real reason to have two distinct uh, types, null and undefined. In fact, every other language doesn't have this distinction between null and undefined. Um, I could probably try with Python again. Let's see what happens. I hope this, is, this going with Python is beneficial to you. What happens if I say age? age doesn't exist. But if I say age is equal to nil, it says like this, no, null. Uh, I don't remember how to say it. null. Okay, how do you create nil values in Python? Python null values. As you can see, I'm not, I, I don't know, oh, none. It's called none in here. So uh, age is equal to none. Okay, so what's my age? Nothing. It doesn't even print anything. So it's, it's a different thing, but none stands for, well, no, null or undefined in JavaScript. Uh, in Java, in C Sharp, and in C, and in other statically typed languages, we have null, we don't have undefined. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not a, a, an expert in Python, but I'm an expert in Googling, so one, two seconds of Googling and I find the proper, uh, the, the, the proper information that I need. And this is something that you, a skill that you should achieve too, if you don't have it already. Okay, so we've got other things. We can have objects and we will deal with objects later on. I still, I think we even have, a, yep, we have a whole slide set, a slide deck about objects, which is really, really that important. Uh, we also have this operator called type of. If I say type of some variable, I will know what is the type of some variable. Tiago says undefined means that the variable is waiting for user input. Um, no, I don't want to say this. Um, it is undefined. Maybe the user will give some input and will define that variable. But maybe that variable will be defined later on or uh, will never be defined uh, ever. So it's not strictly related to user input. Undefined, just like null, means, oops, means no value or uh, I don't know the value and that's it. That's the, that's the only thing. Um, I don't know if I can say it better, but try to split the concept of uh, no value or unknown value with user input, because here we are not talking about user input. Maybe someday the user will provide this value, or maybe there will be some other piece of code unrelated to user input that will assign this value. Uh, for example, we can start with uh, let sum is equal to undefined, so we don't have a value for the sum, but then we have apples, which is two, and uh, oranges, which is three. And now that we have the apples and the oranges, well, the sum will have a value, which is apples and oranges. This does not require any user input. This just means that I gathered some information somehow. I did some calculations. So I didn't know what the sum was before, but now I know how to calculate it. And that's it. And it's the same as saying, I declare sum here, which is undefined, or I can say that its sum is null, which is almost the same, which means that the sum is there, there is a variable called sum, but it has no value at all. It's not even zero, the sum is not zero. It has no value. I don't know the sum. Then, as soon as I get some more information, I can do some calculations, finally, I can give a value to my sum. But this is not strictly related to user input. 
Okay, so the type of uh, operator. If you try to do type of zero, it will give you number. If you do, if you do type of 10 n, it will give you big int because apparently there is this kind of uh, special number called big int. Type of true will give you boolean. Type of foo as a string, any string, the single quote, the double quote, the template literal will give you string. And I'm still, I'm not stopping here. Let's try. I'm going to try here because it's uh, it's faster. So type of uh, zero is number. What about type of uh, one, two, three? Number still. What about minus uh, zero dot thirty seven? Still a number, so a floating point, negative number, still a uh, number. Uh, type of, uh, let's try the big int, what, how was that? 4n, it's a big int, so it's not a number, it's a big integer. And uh, can I say 4.3n? No, because big int, as the name states, is a big integer, so there's no floating point, there's no decimals. Big int is just for huge integer numbers, not for floating points. Uh, what about type of uh, string? Well, not, not string. My sentence in the single quotes, it's a string. What about my sentence in double quotes? Still a string. What about my sentence in backticks? Still a string. So as you can see, the three types of uh, strings that I showed you are just one type. It's the string, but created in three different ways. So three different uh, way, ways to achieve the same result. And then they find, they, they also show other kinds of things which are stranger. Type of symbol. Symbol is a special thing in JavaScript that was recently added to the language and luckily we developers do not need to know it at all. Only certain people need to know symbols, those who create libraries for somebody else. In my experience I never used symbol um, and I never uh, felt uh, the missing of this, uh, of this symbol. So we don't care about symbol for now. I think that there will be um, a lesson about symbols, but I'm probably going to skip it. Uh, it will, I will leave it as an optional uh, subject. Math. Math is a special object, as you can see. And um, we haven't saw math before. But uh, math is an object, and we will see what uh, an object is. But the cool thing about objects, for example, is that with dots, you can ask objects uh, some, uh, some properties and some uh, behavior. For example, if I say math.py, I will see that JavaScript already contains the most accurate value that it can store for the number pi. If you want another good approximation, this is out of curiosity, you can try dividing 22 by 7. And this is already a pretty good approximation of pi. I'm not telling you the mathematical principles behind it, but if you want a good approximation of pi, 22 divided by 7 is already a good one. But if you don't want to perform this calculation every time you need pi, you can just use math.py, which is already provided by uh, the JavaScript language. And math has lots of other things. It has also the number e, which is 2.7718, etc., etc. It has other uh, constants, like the square root of 2, which is uh, 1.414, etc., etc. And it also has other things that we haven't discovered yet, but they are they are called functions. Uh, you can uh, calculate the sine, the cosine, you can round a number, you can do the exponential operator, you can find the maximum number between two numbers. Lots of uh, basic mathematical operations are here under the namespace of the math object. So math is an object and we will see what objects are capable of. The strange thing is that if I Try to do, let's do, clear the console now. If I now say type of null, it's an object. What? I would have said that type of null is null, but apparently null is seen as an object. And what about the undefined then? Type of undefined. Okay, undefined is undefined. So this is one of the biggest problems in JavaScript. Not the fact that you can uh, 
do 2 plus 2 minus 2. This is not that problematic. I think that the most problematic thing is that if you want to see if something is uh, of type null, you cannot rely on type of. In fact, this type of sometimes tell you tells you strange stuff. Like this, type of null is object. What? So, watch out because I never use type of in my life. You ha just have to know that it exists. What about the alert function? Type of alert. Well, I just said it. It's a function. Where you, we already tried doing alert, open parentheses, and then you type any message you want. Well, this spoiler alert, is invoking a function. Alert is a function, and when I open and close parentheses on this function, I'm invoking the function, and I'm also passing a parameter to this function, so it's alerting the message. If I don't pass anything to this function, I'm still invoking this function, but the alert is not telling me anything at all. Okay, so alert is a function, apparently. And functions will be able to do lots of things. I already told you that math is an object, and math has some constants inside, but has also some, um, some other keywords that you can see here in lowercase. And if I, for example, use max, what is the type of max? Oops, sorry. Uh, what is the type of max? It's a function. So apparently math, I uh, math, max is a function that is somehow contained inside the object called math. Okay, so we've got these new types that are so important and so complex that we cannot describe them right away. We are going to describe them in future lessons. We are in JS Fundamentals and we're probably going to look at functions right away, but we have a slide deck about functions, one about objects, another one about data types, because what I'm saying is not the, the, whole, th the whole thing about data types. We have to deal a little more with them. So, type of is one, uh, one keyword that allows you to try and understand the type of something. But I wouldn't rely too much on the type of. Usually you should never rely on what is the type of something. I usually don't use it at all. Then we've got a summary. And then we've got some tasks that you should... Oh well, just one task about strings. Uh, what is the output of the script? I'm not going to tell you right now. We're going to see it next Wednesday. Hey, Lumjacker, is invoking same as calling the function? Yes, yes, exactly. Calling is another uh, term uh, to say that you are invoking a function. In JavaScript, there's also another term, apply, uh, but I don't want to tell you right now. You can apply a function, call a function, invoke a function. It's the same thing. Um, okay, one, l no, probably not one last thing. As you can see, I'm going really fast and there's a lot of stuff to learn. Maybe too much. Maybe we should go slower or maybe we should do more exercises. But uh, you can tell me. Uh, join Discord, join Slack if you don't want to join Discord. And we can... Uh, and we can speak about the pace of these lessons and what uh, is bothering you. Uh, I'm open to feedback and I'm eager to adapt to your, uh, to your needs. So, about interaction. We already know the function called alert. We already know how it works. Alert, string, hello. And this is cool, but it just show you, shows you uh, a message. If you really care about user input, and you should care about user input, so uh, it's a good thing, there's also another couple of functions that you can use right away. They are called prompt and confirm. In your uh, daily work, you will probably never use prompt and confirm because you want to get user input from a form or a text inputs or by clicking on a button. You don't want to prompt the user. Why is that? Well, because if you have a look at how prompt works, prompt how are you doing? As you can see, the syntax looks really, really similar to the alert. But if I do this, it's opening a pop-up with uh, a text input. Uh, I can say I'm fine. And then I can either cancel or, or, or send OK. If I do OK, the prompt is going to return a value. 
What does it mean that a function returns a value? Well, you can see that a function as a black box in which you put some inputs inside the parameters of this function, such as this, how are you doing? And the function is usually sometimes able to return something, uh, for example, the results of a calculation. In this case, the prompt accepts some inputs, uh, the parameter, how are you doing? And as a side effect, it shows you this pop-up. You type it in, something in and the prompt a function is going to return a value. Since this is a value, you can store it. How do you store a value? You use a variable. So you can do something like let mood is equal to prompt of how are you doing. So I'm doing again the prompt by sending the message how are you doing as you can see how are you doing and here i can i'm typing my mood and the prompt at the end when i click on cancel or okay will store whatever value is computed somehow by the function itself if i press okay you can see it's undefined and i'll show you what what it means but if i inspect what the mood is well the variable is now storing the value fine so this is how this thing works. What happens if instead I, well, n now I cannot just uh, re-execute the code. Um, if you were wondering how am I able to type that fast, especially when I created uh, already the, the, the sentence, the statement, it's just that I'm using the arrow functions up and down to go back into the history. I'm not really that fast. I'm just using the arrow keys to repeat a statement. So if I do this, oh, it's working. It shouldn't work because I'm redeclaring the variable. And we already saw that it shouldn't be redeclaring it, but still it allowed me to do it. So what happens if I write anything and then cancel? In that case, the mood is null. So apparently prompt creates a pop-up with a message that I'm typing in here. And if I press OK, it will uh, return and allow me to store in a variable the results of the inputs that I, that, that I, that I put there. Otherwise, if I press cancel, it will just give me the value of null. Is this the only thing I can do? Probably not. Let's go to interaction here. And you can see here that um, this is the signature of the function. It shows you what you can do with a function. So prompt is a function that accepts a, a title or I would say a message and it returns a, a result that you can store in a variable just like we did and it allows for an optional value when you see a signature that uses these uh, square brackets the signature is telling you that this value here is optional in fact i could uh, get away with it without specifying the second parameter but if i want now I can, I can type whatever string in here, for example, gloomy. And in this case, I will see the default value being automatically implemented in here. This is not the placeholder. This is the actual value. So by default, I will see the text input with the value of gloomy. And if I'm okay with that, I can just press okay and I will have my mood to be gloomy. Otherwise, I can cancel and the mood is still going to be null. So the second parameter I can give to the prompt function allows me to just have this uh, default value uh, already available in the text. But if I'm not gloomy and if I'm uh, excited, I can still uh, say it and press OK. And now my mood will be excited. OK, so this is already a really, really important part of an interactive application. And right now we are able to create an interactive application. For example, let's do this. I'm going to create another folder here. Uh, this folder will be called something like um, user input. Or you know what, what's the title of the it's called interaction. I'm going to call it interaction. So rename it into interaction. Interaction. 
And here I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it uh, prompt because we are going to look at how prompts work because alert, we already know how it works, right? So here, finally, I can make my, uh, my grocery store a little more interactive. Not that much, but already enough. I can say that, uh, how many apples do I want? I, okay, let's, let's say let, let apples. Let apples is equal to prompt, how many apples, question mark, and the default could be zero, maybe. Um, let oranges is equal to another prompt, how many oranges? And the default this time too is zero. And then I can do the sum of apples and oranges. And maybe I can alert the sum, or I can uh, just show it in the console. I'm going to go with alert. This is my prompt uh, function. Um, well, not my prompt file, my prompt application. I wrote really fast, so I'm giving you a little bit of time to copy everything and make sure that everything is exactly the same. In the meantime, I'm going to tell you that, first of all, we have an error in this code. It's a subtle error, but it's still an error, and we will have to face this error. Second, how do I now execute this code on the browser? We already said that if I try to go to the prompt.js function from the browser, I'm gonna do it right now. Um, let's go, I should have localhost, right? Localhost on, uh, what was the port, 505? I don't remember, 5500, okay. Um, I go to JS Fundamentals, I go to Interaction, I go to PromJS. This is just showing me the JavaScript file as a text file, it's not executing the file. On the browser, in order to execute this file, I have to either copy all this code and place it in the console, and I press Enter, or if this uh, thing should work inside of a web page, I have to create an uh, index.html, a web page in which I import this file as a script. And you know what? A good rehearsal could be doing this right away. So I'm gonna create a new file inside of Interaction. I'm gonna create an index.html. I'm going to use the exclamation mark that creates all this uh, boilerplate code. I'm gonna write interaction here and in here I'm going to create a script tag with the path in which the file is stored as a source attribute and I make sure that the script tag is properly opened and closed and this should do the trick. Let's see if I go into interaction.index.html uh, or just interaction without index.html. And now I see how many apples? Two. Okay. How many oranges? Three. Okay. 23. No. <laughs> Two plus three is five. So this is the error that I was talking about. There's a problem in this code. And now we need to debug what the problem is. Can you make a guess, an educated guess, on what the problem could be? I'm leaving you a little bit of time to copy and also to reply to this question. What is the problem? Why, if I put two apples and three oranges, why does it, tells me, why does it tell me that the sum is not five, but it's 23? Drum roll. And another thing that I would like to ask you, which is completely unrelated, is that I usually, before each stream, I usually write some text that should show on a notification. Uh, when do you receive this notification? Do you receive the notification as soon as I start the stream? Or do you receive the notification after I end the stream? This is something that I really didn't understand about Twitch. And... Uh, I understood what whispers are. During the coffee break, I documented myself about whispers and it's just private messages. So I saw your private message, Bobby, uh, but I would love you to share your, uh, 
your messages with everybody else because it was not that bad actually and if you're if it's not uh, pertinent to what i'm saying right now or uh, it's if it's completely unrelated or if you're going too too ahead that's fine that's still fine uh, i can just tell it um, explicitly uh, i'm pretty sure you will not get mad at me if i'm saying that what you're saying is unrelated um, it's not an error it's not uh, against you it's still something useful for the whole class and maybe you are you are also stating a, a teaser for, for everybody else. So Angelo says, maybe because the input in the prompt is a string, you got it, exactly, exactly. So even though I said that by default the value is zero as a number, well, the prompt still accepts only strings. Whatever th text I type on this uh, text field will be interpreted as a string not as a number. So I need a way, so this means that these are two strings and this is not a sum, this is a concatenation of two strings, which means that I also need to do a parsing of the string. I have to convert the string into a number. And there are multiple ways to do this. One of these ways is to uh, use another function that I never explained before and probably it's not going to explain it here No, but I'm going to give you a sneak peek on what you can do with JavaScript There is another function that I can try right away on the console Blah 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 and this function is called parse int or also parse float, but let's do parse int parse int if I invoke it, if I call it with no parameter, it's going to give me a nan, a not a number. But if I now add a string, an empty string, it's still a nan, not a number. But if I say apple, still not a number. But if I type any seemingly number in here, for example, one, two, three, then it's going to understand it as a and parse it as a number. So if I put a string containing a number in parse int, it will return, it will give me the number. And it works even if I type uh, strange stuff. Apple123 is not recognized, but 123 Apple is recognized because it starts looking at the string and if it finds any number, it will use them to parse the input. Uh, if I say 123 Apple456, anything after the characters that are not numbers will be completely ignored. But, so as you can see, this parse int is pretty strange, but we can use it right now to just parse any string that was passed from the prompt in order to turn that string, the, the string called two, into the number two that we want. So let's use it. How can we use it? We can do, well, we can make it in multiple steps or all in one step. We can make, and this is another cool thing that I want to show you. So I can do parse int of apples plus parse int of oranges. So I'm not taking the oranges as a string. I'm parsing them as an integer and I'm summing them together. And this will probably give me the proper, the correct result. Our apples are two, oranges are three, and now the number is five. It's correct. Um, Although I like this approach, it's starting to make the code less readable. In fact, if I have other variables to sum here, I will have multiple parse ints in here, which, are, which make the, the sum difficult to understand. It doesn't seem at a glance that this is a, a, just a sum. Um, so we can do something like uh, override the value of apples by saying that the apples were a string and now the apples will have a new value which is the result of parsing the variable itself and we can do the same with oranges I'm not using... okay and now I don't need to parse into anything anymore here look at that, this is not really that different from what we already know these are exactly the same rules as before but I'm using a different recipe. 
The recipe, the new strategy, is that I know I can declare a variable and then reassign a new value. But when I can, what I can do is to assign a new value, which is a calculation on that same variable. Of course I can. Why not? Okay? Maybe you never thought about this, but with experience, you understand and you find natural what you can do and what you cannot do. Well, you can, of course, you can do some computations on the, value, on the variable itself. It'll take the old val value of the variable, it will make a calculation, and whatever calculation was performed will be stored as the new value for that variable. And this is going to work as before. Two, three will give me five. The advantage with this is that I'm splitting all my application into small steps that are easy to understand. There are some developers out there that feel really, really smart. And those developers, instead of writing this kind of code, they write code like this. Alert parse int of prompt of how many apples zero plus parse int of prompt of how many oranges uh, comma zero and this should make the trick I think let's uh, comment out everything here and let's see what happens how many apples two how many oranges three five so this code works exactly the same as before and the smart developers say, look how smart I am. I created all of your code in just one line. This is a one liner. I'm so cool. And another developer would say, yeah, but what does this code mean? Well, of course you don't know what it means because I'm smarter than you. I don't know, of course, what this code means. You don't know it because you're not smart as I am. And this is completely wrong. In fact, I, the smart developer, will probably uh, appreciate this code right now. But in one week, when I completely uh, forget what this code is about, I'm going to go back to this code and will say, just like the other developer, oh my god, what, this, what does this mean? I have no idea what this code is about. And because writing code in a short uh, in a short way, in such a short way, in one liner even, does not make you smart. It, it makes you even uh, a little more stupid than other uh, than anybody else. It makes you proud of things you should not be proud, because as smarter people than I am said, uh, put it really well. Um, any fool can write. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna show it. This was made by probably Martin Fowler. Yeah, a very famous and important software engineer. This is one of the most important things that you can see. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Okay, this is really, really important. If uh, you write code that is difficult to understand for a human being, you are writing code that is more similar to how computers reason. And in fact, if you see how this, your code is uh, then compiled or interpreted by the computer, the computer will probably read it like this. But who cares about that? You write code not just for the computer. You write code especially for other human beings or for yourself. So it is really stupid to write code like this because it's completely unintelligible. And when I see code like this, I usually do some refactoring. What does refactoring mean? Refactoring. Refactoring means that I'm going to change the code so it, it behaves exactly like before, but it's more readable and it's more maintainable and it's more simple, it's simpler. And when I do this kind of refactoring, Usually my code benefits a lot 
because it becomes, well, more readable, more maintainable, uh, and also more extendable. It becomes more powerful. I can do more things. Sometimes it's easier to spot mistakes, so I can fix them easier. Or I can just, uh, it's just more flexible. So refactoring your code is a really, really important thing that experienced and smart developers never do. They usually start typing the code as they think it's, uh, as, well, as a train of thought. And then they always complain that they never have the time to refactor their code because, well, their boss or their products, uh, owners, etc., are always asking for new things. And they don't have the time to stop and think and refactor and fix things. They just type blindly and relentlessly uh, ugly code. But ugly code is really... Uh, an annoyance and it's really really dangerous. That's why this tutorial here and my slides too have one whole section about code quality. Code quality is really really important. It's so important that one of my paid jobs out there is teaching how to write good clean code because lots of uh, companies and lots of experienced developers lack the knowledge and the, 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 the knowledge about the importance of clean code. So they hire me and they pay me a lot of money to teach them how to write clean code and why is it important and how to write clean code even if those companies never have the time to refactor. They do have the time, they just need to find it. Okay, so what I'm telling you in this course is for free something that I'm paid quite a lot sometimes uh, to, to teach uh, in real life. So when I see bad code like this written by someone else or by myself, I usually try to refactor the code. What does it mean? It means that I try to split this huge solution, which looks more like a problem, into smaller chunks of solutions. For example, here I see that there's a plus. So it's a sum of two things. So I'm going to separate those two things inside their own variables. This is apples. And so I replace whatever was the parsing blah, blah, blah with apples. And I'm going to do the same with this. This is oranges. And here I'm saving the result of this computation inside of a separate variable. This already makes a lot more sense because now I understand that I'm summing apples with oranges regardless of how apples and oranges are computed. If I'm okay with that, that's it. But I can do it even more. Um, uh, I have this, uh, <laughs> this habit of uh, always using constants instead of variables. And I'm sorry if I'm doing this. I should probably do let instead of const. But maybe one day I will show you how, why and how I usually prefer use, to use constants instead of using variables. Um, let's see if I have the time to tell you right now. So let apples is the result of some calculation. Uh, let oranges is the result of some other calculation. And now this line is pretty straightforward. I know what I'm alerting. I'm alerting the sum of apples and oranges. If this is not uh, clear enough, I can create a sum, which is the result of summing apples and oranges, and now I can say that the, I'm alerting the sum. Do I need to know what is the sum? I go one line uh, um, above and say, oh, the sum is apple plus oranges. But what are oranges? The oranges are a result of parsing in prompt how many oranges. And what are apples? Apples are parsing in, etc., etc. But again, what is parse int of prompt? What does this mean? Well, I can make it even more clear by saying let apples is this one. Or even more clear, let apples string, because this is a string and I can tell it on the variable. Or, uh, or maybe um, user apples. These are the apples that were uh, given from, by the user. And apples is user apples, oops, is user apples parsed. So now this is the number of apples, which is 
the results of parsing the apples that were provided by the user. And I can do the same, of course, with the oranges. So let's go with the let user oranges is equal to the prompt. And here I can use user oranges. As you can see, this code is really, really similar to the code that we wrote so far. Uh, the one that I commented out in, here on top. The only difference is that I'm using different variable names for each piece of the code. Here, I was using the same variable for the string apples, and then I converted the string into a, a number, and I used the same variables for that, assigning a new value. But in this other case, I decided to make it even more explicit and more clear that these are apples defined by the user. I can call it user defined apples or whatever. Uh, these are the apples defined by the user. And these are another kind of apples. These are the number of apples, which is a result of another calculation. If you like to, to do it like this, you are dealing with, uh, we can call them immutable variables because all these variables never vary. I just declare them, I assign them a value, and I never change those values again. When I'm used to write code like this, well, all these variables can actually become constants. And it's exactly the same. Uh, let's have a look at how it works. Okay, so... Refresh. How many apples? Two. How many oranges? Three. Five. Everything works exactly the same, but now I'm dealing with constants. Every bit of solution that I'm creating will create a variable in which I store the partial results, and every subsequent bit of uh, solution that I create will store that other partial solution in some other variable. This has a lot of advantages that you're not able to understand right now, because I have to tell you a lot more than this. But one cool advantage, for example, is that at the end, you can, uh, you can show in the alert everything, even the, every bit of the solution. For example, we can create a template string in which we say uh, user, user input is user apples and... Um, user oranges then i go to a new line let's see if it works and then we say uh, i don't know uh fruit fruits i don't know if this is correct i'm pretty sure it's not correct in english but let's say um for the sake of uh, okay apples and oranges and finally i can do the sum which is sum, okay? I'm creating a better, let's uh, not, okay. Uh, I'm creating a, a better output in which I show not only the final results, but also the intermediate results. Let's see what happens. How many apples? Two. How many oranges? Three. User input is two, three. Fruits are two and three. Sum is five. Maybe it doesn't show that much. So let's try again. How many apples? two and two you know that this will still work because parse int has this magic thing in which only the uh, the number is being parsed and all the rest will be completely ignored so two and two and how many oranges three and three so the user input was two and two and three and three the fruits were actually the numbers and the sum was five so i can see the final result but also the intermediate results. Because all the steps that I uh, created to, uh, to come with a solution were saved, were stored in their own variables. Instead, if I use this other kind of code here on top, so I'm going to mute this other one here, uh, it's not going to work exactly the same. In fact, I can try to alert exactly the same thing. So I'm going to alert the user input, the fruits, and the sum. But since I don't have the variable user apples, I have to use apples. And instead of user oranges, I have to use oranges. Oops, 
get it wrong. Okay, will this behave exactly the same? Let's refresh the browser. How many apples? One, two, three, hello. How many oranges? Four, five, six, world. User input is one, two, three, four, five, six. Fruits are one, two, three, four, five, six. Sum is five, seven, nine. No, the user input was not one, two, three, four, five, six. It was one, two, three, hello, and four, five, six, world. What happened? Well, it happened that the user input was one, two, three, hello at first, but then I overridden it with this other statement. So I lost uh, a step of the computation. Bobby says, fruits is correct in this case, as it is a mix of more than one type of countable fruits. Oh, awesome, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot for the, the tip on the English language. I really needed it. Okay, so do you see one of the reasons why it is better to use different variables uh, to store intermediate passages uh, of the solution? And probably it will not be easy for you right now to understand why these variables should also be constants. But uh, one thing that I can tell you is that for, if for some reason someone wants to change the value of user apples and say that they are uh, none. I don't think this is working. Let's say, oh yeah. How many apples? Two. How many oranges? Three. No, you're doing something that I don't allow. The user apples should always be taken as user input. So I don't want to override this value with my own code. So you can say that this is more of a security measure. If some developers doesn't know that they shouldn't touch the user apples, because user apples should always be just a result of user input, maybe that developer could write user apples equal to none, and you will be there ready just by replacing let with const saying, no, no, you're not allowed to specify any value you like. The value is decided only at first with this prompt function. Okay, so const has advantages and one of these advantages is to uh, disallow people to mess up with your variables. The variables will have one value and it's the value that you decided and nobody else will be able to change this value. Hope it makes sense. And then we finally we've got another uh, user input uh, function which is called confirm. And confirm is a, probably a, uh, you know, a, a special case of the prompt. If you do result is equal confirm question, this is just going to ask you for a confirmation and result in a boolean value. So if I say confirm, did you understand? It's going to open a pop-up that doesn't have a text input. It just has a cancel and an OK. And if I say OK, it will give me true. And if I say cancel, it will give me false. So in your case, it will probably be cancel, cancel, cancel. No, I don't, don't think so. I really hope that you are understanding. And if you're not understanding, please reach out to me. I'm eager to explain it even more and to do some more practice and exercises together. I don't want to spend these lessons in doing exercises, so I'm going to do them on Wednesday afternoon. But if I see that it's not enough, then I will start doing exercises during the lessons too. No worries about that. Uh, just tell me what you need. So, this is a cool way to get some Boolean input. If you don't want to use confirm but you want to use prompt, you can probably do something similar to what we've done so far. So you can say const is happy is equal to prompt are you happy? And I can say true but now is happy is a string. And if there is a parse int, there is probably also a parse boolean. Let's see if there is parse boo. No, there's not. My hypothesis was not correct. No parse boolean here. What about parse uh, int on a boolean value? 
what does it happen? Not a number. So as you can see, integers are pretty easy to parse because there's this parse int. Floats are easy to parse. In fact, there's also a parse float. Uh, parse float of one of 3.14 should work. Yep. And it probably works even with an integer. Yep. But there's no parse boolean. So how do you parse a boolean? There's many ways. We will see them together. One strange way that I love, because it's a little hackish, is specifying exclamation, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, and then the variable. Oops, I misspelled it. Is happy, is true. Why is that? I'm not going to tell you, because it's already 1351, and I don't want to tell you uh, too much, but I want you to, to give you some cliffhangers so you will be eager to, uh, to continue the lessons <laughs> later on. Uh, so, tasks for this, create a web page that asks for a name and outputs it. Not only, maybe you can create your first own web application, just like this uh, about apples and oranges, maybe you can create your first calculators, for example. You can create a calculator that sums two numbers or multiplies two numbers, divides one number by another number, or you can create something that, I don't know, calculates the, uh, the, the, the sum of two invoices, or I don't know, how many friends and parents you have, whatever, whatever you, you, you feel like. Of course, it will not be a huge application, uh, you don't know enough to create more complex stuff, but stick with me and you'll be able to do many things, even uh, game engines such as the one that I'm trying to do these days. Um, I think it's better to not go further on this. Let's see. Uh, so we have interaction, code structure, data types. I think that interaction, I moved it somehow and I didn't want to do it. So I'm going to put it here. Type conversions. Okay, there was another um, another section about type conversions, but you know what? I'm not going to tell you right away. Well, you probably know already some of this. Uh, for example, you probably understood that there are some mathematical operators that should not be uh, applied to strings, but if the two strings contain some number, then the weakly type uh, feature of JavaScript allows you to type something like this and JavaScript will make a, the best effort to convert these two strings into numbers and to do the computation. So the string 6 divided by the string 2 is exactly like saying the number 6 divided by 2 which is 3 because strings are converted automatically to numbers since JavaScript is weakly typed. Um, you can do, this is another way you can convert a string into a number. Instead of using parse int, which is strange, you can just use this number function with a capital N, and there's a reason why it's like that. Number given a string should probably convert the string into a number. Let's try. Number of one, two, three. Oops, syntax error. Is giving you one, two, three. What about one, two, three, A, B, C? No, this does not work. Well, parseInt is more resilient. ParseInt of 123abc actually works. So you have to put a string containing a valid number in order to make the number work correctly. And if there's a number, will there be also a boolean that allows you to do the same? Let's see. Boolean of the string false is giving me ah true. No, it should give me false. So this is one of the quirks that we have in JavaScript. Sometimes you type things and you expect them to work. Of course, if number one, two, three gives you one, two, three, then why Boolean false gives you true? Uh, these are some quirks in JavaScript that were never fixed because of backward compatibility. So you have to understand why it is like that and you have to stick with it or just find other ways to convert uh, a boolean, a string into a boolean. For example, I tried this thing here, which probably wasn't even correct. If I try to do this, it's still giving me true. So booleans still have some strange problems in them because probably a false value is something that contains an empty string. 
So boolean of empty string for some reason gives me false. Uh, what about a space? No, this is already true. What about the zero? This is still true. So the only thing that converts a string into a false is an empty string. Not a space, not a zero, not a minus one. You can try whatever you can. It's still going to be just the empty string. Whatever else you put inside of the string will be converted into a true Boolean. And this has something to do with truthy and falsy values. Truthy and falsy means a value that is not a Boolean, so it's not true or false, but you can interpret it as something true or something false. But we can see it uh, ne next time. The last thing that I want to show you about the quirks in JavaScript is what I put in here, this piece of code. Let's try to type it. Array 16, so array 16, and uh, what else? Array 16, join string hero minus one plus Batman. Um, you know what, I'm going to type it somewhere else. I'm going to type it here because I don't want to show you the, the final result. Array of 16 plus, we said join, right? Join string hero minus one. Oh, it's already going to sell, tell you what it is. And then you can catenate with Batman. Oops. And plus a space. And here's the result. Na 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 Batman. <laughs> so this is a stupid joke that we JavaScript developers crack, and it's about generating 16 not a number values. So these are nan 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 16 times. You concatenate them all together, and you end with Batman. And now you've got Batman's uh, song. So, I think that's it for today. There's already way too much to digest. So, we're going to stop for today. Um, remember, you can join on Slack, but maybe from now on it is better if you join on Discord. So, I already gave you the invitation link and I'm going to give it again and again and again and again at the end here. So please join Discord and we can create the community on Discord. Discord has some cool extra features um, compared to Slack. It's also completely free, even the premium features that Slack uh, makes paid. And um, it also has this uh, speak channel that we can try together. The only thing that I really don't like about Discord is that you cannot reply in threads which is something that I really loved about Slack. In fact, for example, Sao uh, wrote, uh, shared this curriculum and I started replying in a thread, which is not cluttering the whole chat uh, with our messages. And the messages are located inside a single thread. But still, first of all, we can have uh, multiple topic threads, such as um, announcements, CLI, Git, web design. We can create also, a, you know, a channel called portfolio for example in which you share your portfolio and we can discuss about your portfolio so one thing that we can do is to create multiple channels and multiple categories on the fly and the second thing is that that i see is that nobody is chatting on slack or on discord so it's not really that a big of an issue to uh, to to not have uh, threads since nobody is overlapping, since nobody is chatting, for now, at least, for now. Um, I'm part of uh, another network of developers in which instead they write lots and lots of messages. So this is another uh, completely different situation in which someone is in fact complaining about the lack of threats. But anyway, so that's it. See you next Saturday or see you next Wednesday for some practice together. I will try to, uh, to, to write code without rehearsing anything, just like if I were you. And in the meantime, remember to eat pasta and code faster. Thanks a lot, Angelo. Great lesson. Thanks, Anthony. Looking forward to next week. And hope to see you soon. Bye, guys. Ciao.